Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. I had the opportunity to meet her before she passed, and she was an incredibly gracious and decent woman. She served us all with strength and wisdom for 70 years. Her Majesty was a rare and reassuring constant amidst rapid change. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The UK at the epicenter of the world. Live from London for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Live from London for the next 10 days. Tom Keane, a somber mood hanging over this country. A somber mood, very different from when Lisa and I were here in, in January. And you picked it up right from Heathrow coming in uh, today. It is, it is the beginning, John, of, I would say, 10 days of mourning for the Queen. And then the new getting used to, as we will hear later today, from King Charles III. And Lisa, a change of leadership leadership in more ways than one in this country over the last week. It comes at a precipice of massive change on multiple fronts. You have the change with the new prime minister. You have the change with the new inflationary regime. You have the change with Brexit. And now you have a change in the person who is the glue for a lot of the cultural aspects of modern Britain that a lot of people really look to. So how will the new leader, King Charles III, really take over? The number one buzzword, I think, in the last 24 hours or so, Tom, has been continuity. How many times have we all heard the word continuity? 70 years on the throne. And I think the biggest statistic that I've heard, Tom, over the last 24 right. hours has been the very fact that she reigned for longer than, longer than 85% of this country has lived. I mean, get your head around that. Yeah, the length, the length of it is extraordinary, and there's other parallels, including Queen Victoria. But I, I take your point, John, that a huge part of England has lived with this queen, and now there's a new. And I, I, I would suggest, you know, not that we're going to do the royal show for the next 10 days, but I would say there's a huge mystery about the path forward for King Charles III. We will be staying on top of the price action as well. I'll check in on that for yeah. you right now, looking at equities bouncing back just yesterday <clears> and continuing to do so today on the S&P 500, up around about eight-tenths of one percent on equity futures. We need to begin this morning, though, with our team coverage. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson in London, Anna Edwards outside of Buckingham Palace and Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Anna, first to you. Walk us all through what the next 10 days is going to look like for this country. Good morning to you, John, uh, everybody. Yes, uh, here at Buckingham Palace, the mood uh, sombre, as you would expect. Many people gathering here to pay uh, respects. And a nation probably still in shock, dealing with what has been a very fast-moving uh, situation over the last 24 hours. This time yesterday, we were just dealing with the news flow that there were concerns around her death, and now we find ourselves marking her passing. In terms of the next 10 days, we start this period <coughs> of mourning. Uh, the Queen's body has returned to London. She lies in state. People are given the opportunity to walk past uh, the body to sign books of condolence. In the more immediate future, we'll hear from King Charles. He will return to London today and he will address the people. The things he will say, the words he will choose, the way he will try and speak right. to the people and rally the nation will be, of course, compared <clears throat> to the Queen and, and, and watch very closely. And of the fondest memories of my childhood is my grandfather and I doing the jigsaw puzzle of Buckingham Palace and the changing of the guards. How does Buckingham Palace fit in to the royal family as they mourn? We know of Scotland. We know of Windsor Palace. How does Buckingham Palace fit in to the schedule they're going to see for the next 10 days? Right. Well, I mean, this is a place that, of course, is the centre of their London life. They have many residences to the west of London at Windsor and up in Scotland as well. It's interesting that you, uh, you cast your mind back to, to family memories, uh, Tom. I do too. I had messages from, from, from family members just this morning, talking older family members, uh, talking about how they remember seeing the Queen at the time of her coronation uh, on tour around the country. So although a lot of the focus will be on London this week, uh, she was somebody who toured the country. She was someone who toured the world. She was someone who was head of state here, but also in 15 <laughs> other countries around the world. And it's in all of those places where feel people are feeling this news today. And Anna, she was actually the person who met with more world leaders than any other person out there, uh, at least according to one statistic that I read. She also is known for founding a very modern version of what the monarchy is within the British culture. What is the new modernity of the, uh, the monarchy, given where we are, given uh, King Charles III? 
I was just discussing this with our editor-in-chief in our last programme and asking, you know, with the coronation, we haven't seen one of these for 70 years. Britain has changed so much in 70 years. As a monarchy, do you want to project uh, the face of tradition and, and history and all that it, that it taps into? Or do you want to give a sense of moving with the times and, and moving, uh, moving on a little? And he was reflecting on how culturally there might be some aspects of that. So we might find that the coronation, and that might not come for many months, maybe a year or so, that the coronation of King Charles III might be more uh, more multicultural than we would have seen, of course, in 1952-53. But that in many ways it will hark back to the Britain of old, and and that is essentially what a lot of people sign up to the monarchy for. You know, you don't want to shine too much light on it. You don't want to normalise it too much. I want to bring you in on the future of the leadership under King Charles. This isn't exactly a person that's hit his feelings on particular issues over the years. How do you think that's going to take shape in the years and decades to come? See how things develop. The, the Queen's authority wasn't inherited. I think it was earned. It was earned over many years. Uh, it was earned by the way that she handled various situations. We will see whether or not King Charles can earn the same kind of authority and respect. It's too early to tell. We have an idea. He's served a very long apprenticeship. Uh, but that apprenticeship was different. It is different when you are king uh, to, 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 the, to the learning process that you go through beforehand. So I think it'll be very interesting. But we do find ourselves with a new <coughs> prime minister and a new king, a moment of instability for the country. Uh, and it's it's going to be interesting, John, over the next few days to see this process of transition working. Some things will be happening. We don't get ONS data today. We do get it next week. Do we get a Bank mm -hmm. of England meeting next week? All of these kind of things right. uh, need, to, uh, need to ultimately kick back into gear. But the next few days will be about transition. But ultimately, this, this, this country's got a lot of questions to answer, most notably on the fiscal front. How do we afford what we need? Guy Johnson, you mentioned the Bank of England, clearly the Bloomberg world. How much of the country will shut down over the next 10 days? Sporting events, rugby events and the like. Uh, there'll be a series of events that will not take place, Tom. Kids will go to school, people will go to work. That process will continue. Um, uh, the ONS data will continue to be released if we bring it back to the Bo Bloomberg world. But some big sort of set-piece events will not take place. Um, and interestingly enough, train strikes, strikes generally, will not take place. Uh, so there will be certain things that will not be normal uh, over the next few days. Much of the country will continue, uh, but obviously we are in a 10-day period of mourning. Uh, but but it'll be, it, 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 is a, it is a hiatus. There are big questions that this needs, that, that need answering around the future of this country. The next 10 days is a break from that. It, it will delay, for instance, an understanding, a detailed understanding of how we're going to pay for this big fiscal package that the new government is going to be introducing. And this comes, Maria Tadeo, at a time of great uncertainty within the whole European continent about the energy project. And this had been one of the leadership uh, members, at least when it comes to connecting the United Kingdom to the rest of the European Union. As you talk to members in Brussels, how are present are they? How, how much are they aware of what's going on in the United Kingdom, not only on the fiscal standpoint, but also some of the leadership changes? <clears throat> Look, I think I would point to the words of the French president who said this morning, on est tellement triste, we're so sad uh, by this. And that was echoed by Mario Draghi, by the German government, by the big monarchies too of Europe. Remember, these are houses that are connected by blood going back uh, centuries. And there has been, as you say, tension over the past year, especially after the Brexit uh, referendum. But all of this is forgotten this morning. And I can tell you, behind the scenes here, the European institutions, you do see the European flag at half Masked. There was a moment of silence today and the politics that have been at times very difficult today, they're completely forgotten and they agree that this is someone that is a, a giant of history and will go down in history as such. The politics forgotten, Maria, but the problems don't go away. How are they going to address these problems going into the weekend? Well, the problems do not go away, and at times it is hard to, to, to deal with the emotion that, 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 you, that you can feel here today. And then, of course, the reality of life, which is this is going to be a very hard winter for a lot of uh, Europeans. There is an energy uh, minister's meeting that is going on behind the scenes. Essentially, at this point, is just throw out ideas, brainstorm anything that can work and can bring down energy prices. They want to study. What I hear today, though, is that we're not going to get the breakthrough that the market wants. There will be a political 
impetus that there, the market needs to be intervened in one way or another, particularly the gas, but it's not going to come today. In fact, what I hear is that you'll have to wait until next week. Ursula von der Leyen is expected to put out executive action, and then it becomes a political story, as it always is, in Brussels. European leaders are only going to meet the 27 together at the start of October unless they decide to call an emergency meeting at the end of the month. Maria, thank you. Good to catch up with you and the Bloomberg team. Anna Edwards from Buckingham Palace and Guy Johnson here in London too. Tom, it's easy to forget because it's been totally buried in the news flow and, and rightly in the last 12 hours or so. But Tom, we just had one of the biggest pieces of fiscal intervention in the history of this country in the last 24 hours. Oh, the, the news flow is extraordinary. And, and I think that's a good place to begin as, as we go through this week of mourning for the Queen within the tradition of it. You look back at all the different uh, monarchs over the years, they had huge fiscal crises. This is no different. This is no different than the fiscal crisis that Charles I faced, or frankly, Charles II faced with Medway. It's, 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 it's a different modern way, same issue. I said yeah. it was a change of leadership, at least in more ways than one. It's not just a change of monarch, it's a change of prime minister, and it's a massive change to fiscal policy to address a huge issue which the UK is grappling with, and as Maria was discussing just moments ago, the Europeans are dealing with as well. It's a massive moment. This is a sea change moment on many different levels from a leadership standpoint, but also not only fiscal, but also monetary standpoint when we talk about what we've looked at, what we may expect from the Bank of England if they have their meeting. To you, she was your queen. To us, she was the queen. The words of Emmanuel Macron, the French leader, just moments ago. Coming up, Brian Weinstein, the head of global fixed income at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. We'll catch up with him in just a moment. Futures are positive, seven-tenths of one percent. Live from London. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The face of the United Kingdom is changing. Within hours, Charles will be formally proclaimed as king in a ceremony dating back hundreds of years. He is succeeding his mother, who was the country's longest reigning monarch when she died Thursday at the age of 96. Her death set off a 10-day mourning period that will end with the state funeral at Westminster Abbey. European Union energy ministers hold an emergency meeting in Brussels today. They'll discuss the first political steps on how to prevent Russia's cutoff of energy supplies from leading to rationing, blackouts or even social unrest. The EU is considering a series of radical plans to tame runaway energy prices and keep the lights on. King Jong un is raising the stakes for a military confrontation with the U.S. and its allies. Kim expanded the circumstances under which North Korea would launch a nuclear strike. North Korea listed five conditions for using weapons of mass destruction. One of them is if Kim's leadership is threatened. The U.S. Justice Department will appeal a judge's order for a special master to review documents seized from Donald Trump's Florida home. Federal prosecutors say the ruling has thwarted a review of the potential national security impact. They also want to continue using the classified materials as part of an ongoing criminal investigation. And a federal appeals court has saved Citigroup from an epic blunder that became the talk of Wall Street. Judges rejected a lower court ruling that Revlon creditors could keep more than half a billion dollars the bank accidentally sent them. City CEO Jane Fraser said the mistake showed examples of manual processes that need to be automated. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We need to act now forthrightly, strongly, as we have been doing, and we need to keep at it until the job is done to avoid that. We think we can avoid the, the kind of very high social costs that, that Paul Volcker and the Fed uh, had to bring in, into play in order to get inflation back down and set us up then for, for a long period of, of price stability. Chair Powell, kind of programming with President this Lagarde worked. in the last 24 hours. Did you, you think, think it worked? worked? Did you think it worked? I thought it worked. I mean, when the president of the Cato Institute says that Bitcoin guy married his daughter. Okay, see, that you've, got, you've got to explain this. Conference. You've got to explain this. See, so the Humphrey Hawkins testimony from Chair Yellen, how many years ago was that? Yeah. A number of years ago. There's yeah. a man in the background holding a sign saying, yes. buy Bitcoin. Correct. 
It was the son-in-law of the president of the Cato Institute. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that was the most notable thing of the entire press conference, which you was You thought the rest of it was boring? Uh, not boring. I thought that it was interesting. It was an unusual press conference. But did he say anything new other than to reiterate their uh, determination no, to was... raise rates and curtail inflation, doubling down on what we heard from Christine Look, Lagarde? The interns flew with us to London. That's great. Hi, guys. <laughs> You know, John, what, what I think is important about what Jerome Powell uh, said, I think what uh, was so important about uh, what he said yesterday is he continued the dialogue given other central bank meetings. And we don't know of the Bank of England, but they're all reacting now to the Fed. The clock is ticking was yeah, the takeaway from yesterday to re-anchor inflation expectations. <clears throat> I think he did in some ways double down on the effort from Jackson Hole. Bank of America, Mike Gapen over there, came out just a maybe an hour or so after the address, Tom, and said 75 in September, no longer looking for 50. So I think 75 becomes the number that's nailed on for a lot of people, Lisa, basically because we didn't get the pushback in that address. Do you think that it was that, or do you think it was Lael Brainerd coming out and really doubling down on it as well? That everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet around the world, basically saying, raise rates, raise them aggressively, we've got to front load this, and actually saying 4% looks more realistic than a 3.5% for the terminal rate. A President Lagarde just moments ago, rising inflation is a major concern. Tom, I thought that headline would excite you. Didn't she say that a couple of days yeah, ago? Yeah, the ECB is determined, united, to bring inflation back to 2%. Can't do much to lower gas price and power bills. And that brings us back to the UK, and I want to keep going back to this. We will quite rightly pay respect to someone who has absolutely dedicated their life to this country, as we should. And we'll cover the 10 days of mourning that will take place and all the developments that go along with it. I don't think we should lose sight of what was delivered yesterday at the same time. It's still something that we need to discuss. The news flow is extraordinary. The biggest and, 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 fiscal intervention, one of, yeah. that we've seen in the post-war period from this government, from the UK, to address a major, major energy right. issue that does not go away, does not go away just because the news flow has changed. It's still something that needs to be worked and on. And the backdrop of the war in Ukraine, with Ukraine advancing over the last 24 hours, makes it even more... Uh, a complex. That's what we're going to try to do here, folks, for the next number of days is the morning for uh, the Queen of England and also try to keep forward the Bloomberg surveillance world with futures up 28. John, do a quick data check for me. Help me out here. I noticed coming off the plane uh, the real yield. I couldn't get Wi-Fi in the Gulf Stream, and I look at the real yield, 0.85 per uh, basis points. That's important. In at around 350 seems to be the level of the front end of the yield yeah. curve on a two-year, and Lisa, that <clears> seems to be where we're hanging out. Right now, yields are back in by about three basis points at 347. But, Tom, 350, that right. kind of range, that's where we're anchored at the moment off the back of the Fed speak. Too short a conversation this morning with Brian Weinstein joining us, head of global fixed income at Morgan Stanley Investment. Brian, how has your view changed in this tumultuous week? Oh, what a week. Um, somber week, but but it hasn't changed that much. I think you guys are on it this morning. Um, welcome to the, to the UK. Um, it's uh, not a lot of new news. The central banks have doubled down on what they've said. Um, there's not a ton of new information, except, as you said, the fiscal stimulus, right? I think fiscal stimulus from the UK, more fiscal stimulus coming across Europe is going to make their job harder, right? They need to continue to be diligent on rates staying high um, in order to stave off uh, inflation and the psycho psychology of inflation. Well, let's talk about that. The credit premium that's given to UK gilts, the credit credit premium that's given to other areas of the European region, and frankly, even in the United States, as a result of certain fiscal measures that are expanding the deficit and raising questions about who's going to finance that. Has that sufficiently been priced in to Britain, to European bond yields? Well, certainly it's been priced in more in Europe and, and the UK than, than in the US, um, but, but I think the short answer is no. Um, I think this is a very tough situation. I, mean, I, I think it's very difficult to be the head of a, of a central bank right now because you're fighting an inflation that is, that is partly from energy and partly from psychology, and you're fighting growth that's falling because of it. So to be raising rates aggressively into falling growth and energy you can't control means credit spreads uh, should have a premium, and as you said, more debt uh, on, the, on, the, on the heels of it, so someone has to buy it all. Why is it that the ECB and the Federal Reserve both have really uh, shrugged off suggestions of recession, not use that as their base case, and then double down on raising rates? Does that lead to a lack of credibility or simply just people saying this is what they have to do? 
I think they're trying to buy back credibility, right? They stayed too easy too long. With 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 a, if they had a crystal ball, they would have raised rates. I think long before they did. Um, so in absence of that, and in, in, in I think in light of where where they started at zero or negative, uh, no choice, right? So yes, growth is slowing. In a perfect world, they would have been higher to begin with, um, but now they have no choice to be credible. They have to fight the current inflation and worry about growth later. And they can't basically nod to the market that we're going to ease again right away. Although it does seem more and more likely as growth falls. Brian, a question the Lisa and I keep returning to is the long list we've got of people who say we've already seen the high of the year on the 10 year. And more recently, some people are starting to lean against that. Are you one of those that lean against that view that think maybe there's a little bit more upside here at the long end? You know, I continue to be in a camp that the curve inverts more. So I don't think we've seen the high in the front end. Central banks, I think, have been pretty clear on that. On the 10-year note, I think we'll test a slight new high. I don't think there's anything outrageous happening. But yes, it does feel like rates have not found their, their high. It feels like credit spreads still have more work to do. Um, so I would say not an outrageous new high. I don't know if we're going to see, you know, 4% would be a place I'd, I'd lean against. But I, I do, as we've spoken on the show before, I think, you know, the market's going to test above 350. <clears throat> Brian Weisley and Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Brian, thank you. Lisa, if we test about 350, I do wonder how many people will come on this program and say 350, great buy. <laughs> You know, I don't know, because as the yields move up, so too does the background, does the narrative. I mean, I'm thinking about Deutsche Bank, and Maria today have pointed this out, that their uh, strategist came out this morning and said, because of what the ECU did, because of what they said, they see a 75 basis point rate hike in the November meeting, in the October meeting. How yeah. the idea is that they're going to be raising again at the same kind of record pace. Unsurprisingly, President Lagarde was criticized yesterday, Tom, over the staff forecasts from the ECB. The baseline oh. did not include a recession. Yeah. No recession in the baseline yeah. when for right so away. many people the base case is that this economy goes into recession. There's a war on. I think the uncertainty is off the chart. I was surprised there was not more of a tilt or language to a recession uh, as well. And again, if the, we hear from the Bank of England on our visit to London, uh, and I think that's really uncertain right now. But if we do, they have the same risk. How do they gauge GDP? How do they gauge a lack of growth in the United Kingdom? It's difficult. Cable right now, by the way, at 116. Lisa, this apparently is not forward guidance, but we'll probably hike at less than five more meetings was the language we got from the ECB president. Right, and yesterday. that they what does probably that mean? will do more than two meetings. <clears throat> so. What does that mean? Does it, that mean three, four? <laughs> it's our forward guidance that we're working John, with. There's no tang in London. Okay, is that appropriate? Yeah, that's probably not. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Futures up, eight tenths from London. This is Bloomberg. Live from London this morning, and good morning with you for the next ten days as the country goes into mourning after the passing of Queen Elizabeth. Let's check the markets for you. Futures look like this this morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500 up eight tenths of 1%. That's the story of the equity market in the bond market. Yields looking like this, coming in three basis points at the front end on a two-year. On a 10-year, Tom, down five basis points to about 326, 327. Euro dollar, here's some euro strength for you. Euro dollar up about nine tenths of 1% on that currency pair, Tom. 10090. Right now, an important moment with Mohammed El Arian, who's been such a friend of Bloomberg surveillance over the years. He is a president of Queen's College, Cambridge, and they are deeply affected by the death of their patron. Dr. El Arian, the history of Queen's College is extraordinary. We don't need to go over it now, but it is the back and forth of Queen and King over centuries and centuries back to roughly 1445. We now have a new transition as well. How do you perceive your patron and the shift to King Charles III? Tom, thanks for having me. Um, we are extremely sad at the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. I don't think I can find words that express the size and scale of the loss that's being felt um, by the United Kingdom by people around the world, and especially by our community. Because as you say, she was our patroness. She visited the college. She encouraged and inspired generations of students, of faculty, and of staff. So there's a real sense of loss right now and mourning and wanting to honor her incredible reign. 
Um, we're not looking forward, to tell you the truth, as to what next right now. This is a period mm -hmm. of deep reflection and gratitude for what Her Majesty the Queen did for Queen's College, Cambridge. One of the hallmarks of her reign was the diversity of the United Kingdom. Cambridge led on that as well, and some would say Muhammad al-Aryan led on it as well. There's the shock of the trust cabinet, the senior officials showing the diversity of the United Kingdom. From the University of Cambridge, state the diversity that Queen Elizabeth brought. She would speak to everyone and, he would, and would encourage us to be more inclusive, more diverse, and to continue in the daily fight of reducing obstacle to access to a Cambridge education. It's all about access and participation. And Her Majesty was a leader in this regard. She believed in a very inclusive in, um, community. I cannot tell you that when she would come and visit us, she would spend as much time with the president as she would with the head gardener, with the head of our student body. She would go around and talk to people in a very personal and engaging fashion. And she was an inspiration in terms of inclusion and diversity. Mohammed, the last time she visited you was back in 2019, as recently as 2019. Can you share with us just a little something from that, how special that visit was for you and the college? You know, it was incredibly special, John, um, not only because we were hosting Her Majesty for lunch, but we invited our community to come out. And the joy with which they welcomed her to Queens and the interaction with her. Um, there are pictures on our website of her meeting with the students, meeting with the staff, um, spending time and caring. And then it was a wonderful lunch in which we thanked her for her very strong support of our college. You know, she, she followed the Queen Mother, who was our patroness before her. Um, and it's been a constant for us, just like it has been a constant for the whole nation. Mohammed, this has been one of the key points that people keep coming back to, that she was the embodiment of a spirit of the United Kingdom that will be hard to replace, and that she really created the modern version of a monarchy. Can you give us a sense, a more tangible sense, of why it is, especially for people outside of the United Kingdom, that she acted in this role even though she is a figurehead, right, that she is apolitical uh, by definition, and that she is looking to remain a sort of a, a, a public relations persona rather than a leader like the parliament? It was Lisa, her inspiration. She has inspired so many in the United Kingdom and around the world. And, and I would argue she will continue to long inspire people around the world. So where did that inspiration come from? I think from three things. One, her empathy. She, she was very empathetic. She listened to people. Second, her dedication. She said it on day one that she would be dedicated to serve the nation. And she continued serving the nation for over seven decades as the monarch. And third was her responsiveness. So when you put these three things together, it, it sums up in inspirational leadership that overcomes all sorts of divisions within society and that was flexible enough to take the United Kingdom through massive changes. If you look at how different the United Kingdom of today is compared to the, the one of 70 years ago when she um, became queen, and she, she was able to navigate all that, inspiring us, inspiring a whole nation throughout that whole period. Mohammed, given how much things have changed, as you talk about, given Brexit, given the fact that the United Kingdom has shrunk in its scope with relation to some of these trade partnerships, or at least nomenclature, what is the new vision going forward? Does it adhere back to that one, or is this truly a marking of a new regime? You know, there are many challenges facing the United Kingdom, and that's true for the new prime minister, who recognize that on day one. But I think, Lisa, right now, it's about Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It's about mourning her death. It's about honoring her accomplishment and honoring her reign. 
Um, then will come the day when we will sit down and talk about all the challenges ahead. But I think this is a really important moment in history um, because she has played such an important role, not just in this country, but around the world. Mohammed, thank you for marking this moment in history with us. We appreciate it. And I think we all agree it's certainly not the day to discuss markets and the economy with you, Mohammed. Thank you very much for giving us your time this morning. Mohammed al in there of Queen's College, <coughs> Cambridge. Tom, as we reflect on what's been left behind, and I think naturally we'll begin to look to the future, the two words we've talked about a lot over the last 12 hours, we talked about continuity. The other one was unity, the ability to unite the country at a time when it's becoming increasingly divided. We'll discuss, no doubt, over the next 10 days about Britain's role in the world. We also need to have a conversation about what the United Kingdom is going to look like in the years right. to come as well. Because there's a world leaders gather uh, for uh, the service here in eight, nine uh, days. I, I think, John, what's so important, and I can't recall where I saw this, but someone had the empire of an early Queen Elizabeth and where it is now with Barbados becoming a republic just in the last number of years. And yet you see the diversity of the United Kingdom. And at least I, I believe I can say Americans are thunderstruck by the diversity that we've seen in the last 72 hours from Prime Minister Truss. It's, it's amazing, I think, to Americans to see the different melting pot that she helped invent in the United Kingdom. But John, to your point, though, uh, that is the case, and that's why unity all the more forefront, especially with all of the challenges. And I think that that is really one of the main challenges going forward, especially given that this news has overshadowed the biggest fiscal package offered up to the United Kingdom in modern history. The fact that we are on the precipice of some sort of coordinated action by energy ministers in, in the European Union as they meet in Brussels, that we're on the brink of inflation that might reach as high uh, as double digits and beyond the 20s handle. I mean, how do you navigate this without that unity that she brought? And I think that that's the reason why it is pivotal that we're, we're discussing this right now. You'll always see a difference in politics. By definition, in a democracy, you're bound to see division in politics. And we see that in the UK. It's no different to any other country in the Western world. I think the fact that Scotland is still pushing for independence is much, much bigger than just division in Parliament. Tom, that's about the threat to the overall union and a push to break it up. And that's something that still lingers over this country. Oh, absolutely. And isn't going away that. anytime soon. Yeah, I'd say 10 years ago, I was up in Scotland a fair amount, and, and I was naive on this. I was the dumb American. And, John, you see it now is, is Prime Minister Truss had, I, you know, I'm speaking from a distance, had a challenge in, fi in filling the Northern Ireland position uh, in her new cabinet. She she got her man, but it, it was a challenge to get that filled. It's not just Scotland, a little bit Wales, but of course, always the Irish story with Brexit. The economy right now in the UK is in a hugely difficult place. And as we return to have a discussion about what happened in the last 24 hours from the UK, to see Liz Truss deliver that massive fiscal intervention, and Lisa, almost immediately, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, came out and pushed for a windfall tax. And that, I think, defines the political divide in this country at the moment. And it's not unique to Britain. These are the same issues that the Europeans are going to face deep into winter. And one of the biggest calls you've got to make, I think, in the economy and financial markets, and allow me just to take this a little bit broader, is the weather this winter, the temperature. And you speak to market participants at the moment, and the thing that they would love to forecast, if the ECB staff are going to come out with forecasts, never mind GDP and inflation, you need a forecast for how cold winter's going to be and what it means for gas prices, because that's going to dominate the big, big issue. It's going to be the issue through the rest of this year. And it's a worldwide issue, and there's so many different uh, machinations here, but what, do you, what happens if you don't dampen demand? And this isn't just a UK issue, this is also a US issue. I was just reading, for example, that there is the potential for another release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to get oil prices that much lower ahead of the midterm elections. All of these things, at what point does that increase oh, consumption I... and then create? this revolving cycle. 8519 on West Texas Intermediate is a miracle from where we were 90 days ago, 100 days ago. A bit of a bounce back this morning, Tom, yeah. up 2%. Um, 85.19 on WTI crude futures, up 9 tenths of 1%. Equities rallying a little bit over the last couple of days. Coming up, we'll continue the conversation. Sir Robin Niblett, the director of Chatham House, just around the corner from London. This is Bloomberg. 
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, it's the end of one era and the beginning of another. A day after Queen Elizabeth II died following more than seven decades as monarch, her son Charles will be formally pro proclaimed king. Now he is 73 years old and is the oldest person to accede to the throne in British history. The UK has begun a 10-day mourning period that ends with the Queen's funeral. China is stepping up its defenses against COVID. While chunks of the country remain under tight lockdowns, the government is placing more restrictions on inter internal travel. And the steps seem designed to reduce the risk of outbreaks before next month's Communist Party Congress in Beijing. And that's when President Xi Jinping is expected to secure a precedent-breaking third term in office. President Biden rallied Democrats last night with an attack on Donald Trump and his supporters. He blasted the former president for promising to pardon rioters who attacked the Capitol. The president also warned voters against putting Trump followers in charge of the House or Senate in November's elections. And the Netflix series about Queen Elizabeth II's reign will likely stop production on season six following the death of Britain's oldest reigning monarch. That's according to Variety. And The Crown season five is set to premiere in November and feature a new cast. Netflix has not yet released a statement. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. The Prime Minister, Liz Truss, as a nation mourns its longest reigning monarch. Live from London, good morning. Bit of news for you, Tom. Of course, it pairs in in comparison to the kind of conversations we have this morning, but it gives you an idea of the kind of changes we're witnessing in this country to get through the next 10 days. The English Premier League, the matches this weekend will be postponed. Tom, unclear at this point whether next weekend's matches they, will be postponed as be. well, but hey, this, is this, this was inevitable. I understand there was a meeting early this morning, and this is the decision that's been made. The benchmark for me is 1963 and John F. Kennedy, and the nation came to a complete stop and I would suggest this, even with the understanding this day would happen, makes this week a point where the nation, as, as they mentioned, there's no railroad strikes. The people will work to move people around as they mourn. And the other thing so, associated with the football as well, you've got to remember, Tom, and don't need to labour this point, but to put these games on requires a lot of resources. A lot of resources, yes. Particularly from the police. Yeah. And those resources over the next 10 days yeah. will be needed elsewhere. It sounds like what we're going to see here for the next number of days. And, of course, we've got lots of good coverage uh, for you. Guy Johnson and Anna Edwards helping out with truly London perspective. And we're thrilled that we'll go to them here uh, in a bit. Right now, as we spoke with Mohammed El Arian of Queen's College, the University of Cambridge, we touch on another of the Queen's efforts, which is Chatham House. You've heard that name in America, less familiar, but in London, dominant is one of the great think tanks and places of perspective for the United Kingdom. Sir Robin Niblett joins us right now, director of Chatham House. And I thought on your website, the commitment of the Queen, and particularly Robin, to the academics that you did in 2014, her leadership to jumpstart that project. Give us a window into 2014 and what the Queen did for Chatham House. So I'm happy to, um, I'm now a distinguished fellow of Chatham House. We have a new director as of a month ago, uh, Bronwyn Maddox, but um, I had the pleasure of That was hosting... my mistake, excuse me. No, it's fine. I had a pleasure of hosting uh, uh, Her Majesty uh, twice in recent years, uh, once for the Chatham House Prize in 2019 when she gave it to David Attenborough, but 2014, was when we launched uh, the Queen Elizabeth Academy for International Affairs. And I think one of the uh, big challenges uh, for institutions in London has been able to make sure that you're still well connected to young people around the world, engaging them in what London has to offer, what Britain has to offer as a place of independent thinking, which is what Chatham House about is as well. And Her Majesty uh, gave her name to the creation of a new academy, came, uh, uh, met with uh, the first cohort of academy fellows, 
uh, from all over the world. Um, and I think what we wanted to do by having this um, academy named in our honor was capture the fact you're not going to have a patron of institution for 70 years very often. Uh, and it was absolutely remarkable, really mm -hmm. wonderful to be able to have to connect to that way, but also to, to be able to track some of the brightest, most uh, uh, driven change makers around the world to come and spend some right. time. She, her example uh, is a draw. It was the most important part of Britain's soft power. In her example was the Commonwealth. There was a Commonwealth of the early 50s and the tumult of the 60s and 70s. What does Charles III's Commonwealth look like? It's going to be very difficult um, for a number of reasons. Uh, in a way, it was held together by respect for Her Majesty, for the Queen, um, as well as by that common sense of heritage of having formed part of the British Empire. But being forming part of the British Empire, even as independent nations, is now something that receives a lot more scrutiny uh, than it did in the past. Uh, and so what we're going to find, I think, in the coming years um, is potentially Charles having to uh, enable the Commonwealth to redefine its purpose amongst those nations without the glue uh, of Her Majesty the Queen uh, there to hold it together. We've already had uh, some moves away from having uh, the Sovereign, uh, Her Majesty, as the head of state from one Commonwealth member, by Bedos, uh, a year ago. And there's a worry that the whole review of the role of empire, of slavery, and so on, will start to come back in and uh, put the UK in a much more difficult position in the future. Robin, we really do mark the end of an era, exactly as you say, not only a unifying force, but a redefinition of globalization, a redefinition of the United Kingdom and the broader uh, empire that it used to have, right? All of these redefining uh, aspects of the new moment, what will be the new definition of the next 10 years? How will uh, King Charles III come out and shape a new vision in the world as you see it? Look, the challenge that any monarch has here is that they can't establish a vision. They can't declare a vision to the rest uh, of the nation. In our constitutional monarchy, they really are the holders of continuity, but they're not the agents of, of political change and politics. So in a way, it will be up to this trust of future prime ministers to establish the vision of the country. What he has to communicate is, again, the linkage to the continuity. Part of, I'd say, Britain's soft power has been the fact that it has had such stable politics for so long. And however quickly the government's change or the prime minister's change, the fact that the head of state has continuity in the family is part of its power. So what the, the monarchy does is give space to, to governments to go through profound change without a sense that the whole nation is being called into question. So I think, uh, in a way, Prince Charles, who's leant forward quite a bit as a Prince of Wales, on climate change, uh, on architecture. issues of biodiversity, um, on architecture, yeah. exactly, is now going to step back and have to, to become the cipher that the Queen was for what other people believe the nation is. It's going to be a really delicate change. You think it's some real estate investors that are happy? With this in in London, that he might he might back away. I, I, was say, I, think, sober I think they'll be happy for that reason. He won't be able to weigh in the way he did before. This Absolutely. This is important, though. The New Yorker. I read the New Yorker effort here of the last 24 hours, and Robin Mead, uh, Rebecca Mead, uh, was very good about this psychological shift that any monarch has to make. John, yeah. he's Charles, and then he's King yes. Charles the Third. Yeah. Was it Chelsea Barracks? Was it Chelsea Barracks all those years ago? Yeah, so to which uh, the Qataris uh, yeah, had bought, and uh, royal to royal, they were able to have a different type of conversation, I think. Amazing. <laughs> but I'm not getting myself into trouble, I was I love that. your pet projects. All I can no, say just, is know, I want to know the backstory. I, when, I, when I used to live of, in Chelsea, I used yeah. to walk past there, and it was a big, big conversation at the time. Actually, I was doing my, <laughs> when I did my PhD at Oxford, as I was writing it, a building was being built in front in Magdalen College and done in all of the old style of Magdalen College, but being built in 19, whatever it was, 1930 or something. And at one point, as I watched the building go up, I suddenly saw this person walking across the top with a gaggle of people, and it was Prince Charles <laughs> being shown around <laughs> the, the new building. And yeah. I, you know, I didn't have a mobile in those days, but it was the old building in the keeping. And I Amazing. have to say, it worked beautifully. So I'm, I have to say, I'm maybe with him. We'll, maybe I'm with we'll him. see the king doing that. Who knows? <laughs> so, Robin Nibblett, thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you so much. Distinguished fellow at Chatham House. Tika, an important bit of flavour. It's important. Yeah.
No, I, I think it's... This is an assertive guy as a prince, and to Sir Robin's point, it's going to be interesting to see how the he steps back and makes that shift as, yeah. as king. He understands the weight of this throne. One of the articles I, I read on the plane coming over is, is the queen was never formally interviewed, ever. Yeah. Ever. There was conversation like you and I have, but... She was never. Are you sure the conversations were like the ones that like you and I have had? Okay. <laughs> Live from London never with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovic. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from London, for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambert, I'm Jonathan Farrow. We pause now for a moment of silence in remembrance of Queen Elizabeth II. Westminster Abbey's tenor bell and the state bell at St Paul's Cathedral will ring over the city for the next hour. A nation in mourning after losing the longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. King Charles, the eldest of Elizabeth's four children, will formally be proclaimed the king at a ceremony dating back hundreds of years. At 73, as you've heard repeatedly over the last day or so, he becomes the oldest person to accede to the throne in British history. With Tom Keane and Lisa Bramford, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Got a lot to do over the next 10 days, Tom. Got to work through 10 days of mourning in this country, stay on top of the markets as well, and think about the future of this country in a very divided world. As Lisa mentioned earlier, it, it, the moment here, the shock of seeing Liz Truss with that hugely diverse and original cabinet being greeted by the Queen in her, literally in her final hours, a fragile 96 years old, and the backdrop of this, as we witness in the cold world of Bloomberg by, say, Sterling, is a backdrop of crisis. There have been other crises in the country the country will endure, but it, it is as if a script was made of crisis at this moment. Joining us now is Guy Johnson. Guy, we've talked a couple of times already this morning about the next 10 days. Can you walk us through it again, what the next 10 days will look like in this country? Um, there'll be a lot of ceremony. I've just walked past seven RHA, seven Royal Horse Artillery forming up just over the road from where I'm sitting now, Tom, uh, at the Guards, uh, at the guards um, headquarters. Uh, they're making their way up to uh, High Park Corner. They will mark the Queen's death uh, with a salute, uh, a, a gun shot for every year uh, that she reigned. Um, it, it will continue from there. Uh, we will see a series of... Um, of very, very ritualistic events taking place over the next few days that will mark the transition of power, John, uh, from Queen Elizabeth to King Charles III. Uh, we will see a meeting of the Prime Minister uh, and the new King. Uh, we will see a series of meetings of the various councils that are going to run the next 10 days. Ultimately, uh, this is run by the Norfolks. They are uh, and have historically always uh, run the, uh, the, the process of a funeral of a monarch. So it's a very ritualistic process that is going to take place. But behind the scenes, John, there are a series of events that may be delayed, deferred. There is a hiatus here in government. Uh, and ultimately, this is a question, as you've just been discussing, that has got some big questions that need answering. What is going to happen with the fiscal package? What's going to happen with rates? Do we know whether the Bank of England is going to be having a meeting next week? There's still information coming out. We'll get a clearer picture, I suspect, as this day progresses. Right. Guy, what will be the tone of King Charles III's speech this evening? I believe it is 6 p.m. in London, make it 1 p.m. in New York. What should we listen for in that speech? I think we should listen. I think we should expect continuity, Tom. He is standing on the shoulder of a giant, shoulders of a giant, uh, his mother, Queen Elizabeth. Um, she, she earns the authority that she had. She earned the respect that she had. He will be aware of that. This is, this is by birth, 
but you have to earn the respect that she built up. This, this doesn't happen uh, if you are not able to deliver upon that. So he will, be, he will be very aware of that. So I wouldn't expect any fireworks. I wouldn't expect any surprises. He will be trying to sound um, a, a note of calm, uh, a note of continuity. John talked about that in the last hour. This is the word we're going to hear a lot of, and I think there's a reason for it. We are, we are coming out of a period of turbulence. Uh, we now have the death of a monarch. We need to stabilize the situation. That will be the tone of his speech. And it's a delicate moment because of exactly what you say. Some of the issues that are facing the nation that need to be addressed on a fiscal standpoint, and this comes as Liz Truss just announced, uh, one of the biggest fiscal packages ever in the United Kingdom's history. When we talk about the process of what happens over the next 10 days, is Parliament in action? Is there governance in that kind of real way hashing out some of these pretty significant plans that were just laid out? In theory, Lisa, government stops. In theory, the parliamentary process stops. There is a process that we need to go through, a swearing of allegiance, a recognition by Parliament of the new king. All of that will take place. We're going to get an extraordinary Saturday sitting tomorrow uh, that is going to be for senior MPs. So, so that process will continue. Parliament has been recalled. Parliament is here and present in this process. But, but in answer to your question, which I think is... is are we going to learn the details of the fiscal package? Are we going to learn how it is going to be paid for? Um, are we going to understand what is happening on the monetary front in terms of, of how that is responding to that fiscal package? I, I suspect not. So this is a hiatus in that process. It is a delay in that process. And these are the details that the markets want. These are the details that the markets want to hear about. They want to know, are rates going to go up next week? If so, by how much? Are we going to have a meeting of the Bank of England? How are we going to pay for this fiscal package? How is the gilt market going to respond to that? How will ultimately it be paid for in terms of the way that the DMO is going to manage that? These are huge numbers that we're talking about. I suspect that we are going to see a delay in answering those questions. Guy, thank you. Guy Johnson outside of Buckingham Palace. We'll catch up with Guy Johnson throughout the afternoon here in London on TV and radio. I'm happy to say that joining us now is Sir Vince Cable, the former MP and visiting professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Sir Vince, fantastic to have you with us. Thanks for being thank with you. us. Inevitably, we'll talk about change and what will change with a new monarch on the throne. What will change for you, sir? Well, I, I was privileged as a Privy Councillor, Cabinet Minister, to dealt with Her Majesty and... You know, and I, I understand, as I've seen up close, the reasons why the country has such uh, respect and affection for her. Um, and so it is a... I mean, this moment is, on the one hand, very predicted. I mean, we all knew this was going to happen, but at the same time, momentous. And you have a whole generation of people, you know, 70 or under, you've lived your whole life in the Elizabethan age. Um, I think for a politician, um, I'm now a retired politician, I think the significance was that although we had, you know, great change, turbulence, um, big ch secular changes over time, you know, the monarchy and the queen were, was a kind of bedrock of continuity and stability throughout that uh, and remains one of the sort of underlying strengths of the country. And it rests upon the fact that it is a constitutional monarchy, it doesn't have a political role. and. Uh, it will be very important that, that the new king you know, is seen by the world and the country as you know, totally a non-political figure. Uh, Sir Vince, I, th I think it's so important to speak to you here. I'd love to do a two-hour conversation with you right now. If you look at your party history as a kid, when you were at Cambridge and on from there, Glasgow and such, and then you find that you were the chief economist for Royal Dutch Shell for a while as well. You have a backdrop here of this emergency moment for your United Kingdom. How does Charles III provide support to Prime Minister Trust? Well, I, th I think given the way in which the monarchy works, and I think we all want it to continue to work, uh, I think there are very few Republicans in Britain, um, it, it is by respecting this boundary between politics and the head of state role. And, um, I mean, King Charles, has, it's an enormously difficult job. I mean, he's been auditioning for this for 50 years. Uh, he could have stepped into the monarch role at any time. And he, it, it's required extraordinary 
self-discipline from him. Um, and it's been a very, very difficult role. And he's now, as you say, 73, and he's inheriting this responsibility. I think one of the things he will be very mindful of, um, bearing in mind you know, the enormous respect for his mother, who was scrupulously non-political through the whole of her reign, I mean, he has at times, you know, strayed into the political world most recently over Rwanda, and he will, I think, in order to maintain the solidity of the monarchy, be very, mm -hmm. very careful not to go into Is that territory. Is the king territory. a liberal Democrat? Um, I have no idea. I mean, I, I met him a few times, and I, I, I like what he did, and he was, you know, genuinely socially concerned individual. I. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no idea about his political. I think leanings. Tom's trying to cause some trouble yes, here, Vince. Yes, of course. <laughs> I think that's where that's going. I think this well, is such a delicate moment because but if as we've been talking, supporter, he didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we've been talking all morning about dovetailing uh, the death of a monarch who really represented the United Kingdom for so many years and grew up through steamboats until this, this you know, a uh, smartphone. And we are here on the precipice of a massive fiscal package without the unity required to give confidence about how it will be executed, about how effectively it will be managed with respect to the fiscal profile of this nation. How are you watching this as a former member of parliament, the deliberations over the energy help uh, that, that Liz Truss has, pro has proposed to households? I'm surprised at the linkage that's been made with this big economic moment. I mean, they are, I think they are wholly separate. Uh, and I, I, I mean, certainly the new king will want to have absolutely nothing to do with the controversies around the fiscal package. And I shouldn't. Uh, I mean, his role is to provide, I mean, the phrase that you've been using, calm and continuity and stability uh, amongst political and economic upheaval. That's his job. It's not to take up a position on these um, economic decision making. I mean, that will happen anyway. Uh, the big change in the Treasury, of course, has been the loss or the sacking of the permanent secretary. I mean, that is the big event from an economic policy point of view. But, but the planning of the details of the fiscal package will proceed. And I, 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 although there may be a slight hiatus in the announcements, um, nothing is going to happen to disturb the development of the policy. Well, things will pause. Sir Vince, we're just seeing from the Bank of England. The MPC announcement's been rescheduled to 22nd of September, to the 22nd of September. So I understand that's a one-week delay for the Bank of England. Lisa, I think that was the first thing you asked this morning off me when we landed. Are we still <laughs> going to get a Bank of England decision next week? And I said, I don't know. We'll see. And here we are. It is going to be delayed by one week. Yeah, and whether this actually gives them a little bit more certainty might be interesting to see as well, whether we get more fiscal uh, proposals more concretely from both the European Union as well as from Liz Truss's uh, team over in Parliament. Uh, Thomas, as Vince said, things will continue, but for now they pause. And we're seeing that with the Bank of England I, as well. Uh, and we'll see that with a whole host of events that were scheduled to take place over the next 10 days. As I mentioned, my template for this in a very different moment was 1963. I have the clearest memories of how America paused for the funeral of President Kennedy. Uh, why is this different as we saw with the Premier League 20 minutes ago, now with the Bank of England? Who's going who's gonna to push against those institutions? So Vince Cable, can we say thank you? Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time, sir. Very much so. So a Bank of England decision rescheduled. It was scheduled for September 15th. You'll now get that on September 22nd. A Bank of England decision that was widely anticipated. And perhaps, Lisa, it gives them an extra week to work out what this program <clears throat> is from Liz Trust, because it's a very, very different outlook for this economy now based on the intervention that this government has staged to do something about energy. Yeah, well, Andrew Bailey is not in an admirable spot right now, especially given a balance sheet right. and what you do with that, given some of the credit risk introduced by the fiscal And 24 plans. hours after the Fed raises 100 or 125 basis points. That's a good call. It's the day after. Thank you. The day after. You're on top Are of the diary, okay TK. That was better than good. That's good. It was all the sleep I got in the Gulfstream. How much sleep did you get? A Gulfstream, seven hours. I think I got about two. Live from London. This is Bloomberg. Queen Elizabeth II has been a wise and encouraging guide, always wanting the best for our nation and greeting each change with understanding, good grace and an abiding faith in the Australian people's judgment. From her first trip here, 
it was clear Her Majesty had a special place in our hearts and we in hers. The tributes pour in from heads of state around the world. That was Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, live from London this morning. Good morning to you all in New York and good afternoon to everyone elsewhere. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Let's check in on the markets for you. About 7.18 over in New York, 12.18 here in London. Picture of things looks like this. On equity futures up 33 points on the S&P 500. TK, we advance about 8 tenths of 1%. I'm playing the markets today, and, and I, I would say, John, a 22 handle on the VIX, we're back to 32,000, Dow 4,000, S&P 500. And I believe it was you, John, that spanned Binky Chata's views at Deutsche Bank the other day of the spread, the diversity here, even from one strategist. I know, but the come what on. Ifs. I mean, we, but, need to get, we need to get Binky on the show but, because I, I get and, on with Binky. I don't want to have a go at Binky, but we, the difference got, between recession and no recession can't be the S&P at 3,000 and the S&P at 47.50. I know there's way I, I more work that goes behind this. I wish radio could see you and I doing hand semaphores here <laughs> the way we're doing it. But, you know, I, I, seriously, I think the uncertainty here is extraordinary, which means to get to Sarah Hunt here in a, in a moment is really quite important. Right, where's the intervention? You meant to stage the intervention. I was like, which intervention? Are you talking about monetary intervention or Tom John intervention? No, Lisa intervention. <laughs> Lisa <laughs> intervention. I'll intervention. come in and just stand be between you guys. We've, Carry on. We finally have a dollar break. I think that is the news I item agree. as we traveled across. A, a real planet. euro dollar pop. Yeah, we got That's a euro pop. Yen gave yeah. way finally, and we'll have to see where that goes. We welcome all of you from London, Lisa Bramwitz, John Farrow, and myself here for the next 10 days, and it will be an extraordinary ceremony at Westminster Abbey uh, here in a number of days. Of course, many, uh, I, I have to be honest, I'm presuming President and Dr. Biden will attend. I, I think we can I presume. We can presume at this that. point, we can. I think we get heads, heads of state from all around the world flying yeah. in. And we'll see time. how. Uh, that evolves over the number of days with leadership from Anna Edwards and Guy Johnson. Right now, Sarah Hunt joins us, Chief Market Strategist Alpine Saxon Woods, as we continue, consider the markets. Sarah, I, I, I usually don't go market strategy with you. I'm much more interested in portfolio dynamics. But I believe we had a June rally. Is this a redux of what we lived in June? Well, first of all, let me just say that I, uh, from... America, too, we mourn the passing of the queen. It was amazing. She's been the queen for my entire lifetime, and that is sort of a, a shock to everyone's system. Um, so, you know, yep. getting back to mon <laughs> getting back to monetary policy, I, it, I'm not sure if it's a redux from June. I think that June was very much about the fact that we were going to pause and we had peak inflation, and we might be doing a mini version of that right here because you have seen oil prices come down. But I, I, I look at what's going on in Europe and I look at what's going on with energy across the globe, and I have to say that it's, it's hard to say that we're done with that high, with the high prices and how that's going to affect people. So I think right now you've got a little bit of relief in the dollar because the ECB hiked rates, so that makes that swaps out that policy a little bit, so that gives a little relief to the dollar. That's helping equity markets. I'm not sure that it's a full redux of June, however. Sarah, can you just build on something you said about energy? Are you saying that you don't think we fully realise the consequences of the crisis we're in right now in places like Europe, or are you suggesting that that crisis is about to get worse? I really, you know, this is, I'm a long-term energy person, so this goes back to weather, right? You know, years ago, you used to look at the weather forecast to see what you thought energy prices were going to do. And if we don't get a very severe winter, if we get a mild winter, I think that that's going to help a lot. But I still think that there's a lot of pressure there, and it's unclear how some of those pressures are going to be alleviated. There's been a big program in the UK just announced yesterday about how to fix that for consumers, but that doesn't really figure out how to fix that for the companies that have to deal with the input prices and how that's going to look overall. So I think that there's still a lot of uncertainty. And the idea that we're sitting here in September when the weather's fairly mild and feeling sanguine about it, I think is a little bit, it's a little bit premature. So we've been talking all morning about Liz Truss and her recent plan uh, to bring down energy costs for households and how she did not include a windfall tax. How much does the lack of inclusion of a windfall tax, the opposition there, the opposition in places in the United States as well, sort of feed into your bullish stance on energy companies? Well, I think to the extent that there's never any relief when prices collapse, I think that the windfall tax is a little bit of a difficult argument to make. On the other hand, 
certainly given the extraordinary circumstances that we're under, taking it off the table entirely doesn't help necessarily the situation because you're trying to look for some way to fund some of this relief that's going into what they're trying to do for households and for businesses. And Germany is going to have the same issue because you've already seen a lot of complaining from businesses and from consumers there, and they've got skyrocketing energy costs that makes production very difficult. So that's an industrial problem as well as a consumer problem. So how to pay for that becomes the question. And a lot of the policies that have taken years to get to where we are are difficult to reverse. So I think that it's difficult to see how you see a situation resolving itself in a very easy manner, except for the fact that you've got some demand destruction going on, partially on the oil front because of China. But in general, talking about conservation doesn't have to be the malaise of the 70s, but it certainly could be part of the conversation. And that seems to be a little bit off. That, that hasn't been part of that package as well. Sarah Hunt, thank you. Of Alpine, Saxon Woods on the energy situation, what it means in the equity market as well. Lisa, it's uncapped liability. You and I have talked about this so many times now. You can't come up with a number for how much it's going to cost because it is uncapped liability. Right. Nobody can forecast the price of gas. Let's be clear about that. And I don't think anyone right now can get in the mind of a dictator in Russia and what he's going to do to gas supplies, or for that matter, how Europeans are going to respond to it if it gets a whole lot worse from here. Because it's not just the war, it's the response, the policy response to that war that's taken us to this place. With that in mind, Lisa, the stance on the windfall tax is based on where we are now. Now, if you tell me down the road through next year that energy prices, gas prices are going to explode, explode higher again, and that the UK, the British government, has to cover the difference, the fatter margins for the energy companies, and they're on the hook for that, and those profits get bigger and bigger and bigger, all of this depends on what happens with the gas price. Where we are right now, they're telling us no windfall tax. If you tell me we get another 10, 20, 30, 40 percent rally in the price of gas, do you think that position holds? And I don't think we know the answer to that. Well, I think that it would become politically untenable. I think that we can say that with some certainty, that if the if the big energy companies are making bank and they're not investing, as was the plan, as is the big opposition to the windfall tax, if they're not investing in becoming energy independent by, what, uh, 2030, I think, that sure, they wanted? I mean, it, it, then, but you it know, might become financially untenable as but well. That's what I'm saying. In, so in other term. words, in the short term, it might become financially and politically infeasible, at which point they will revisit it. But it's interesting to see where the emphasis is on right now, even as they try to raise money with some very skeptical foreign investors. A weaker currency or high yields? We've had a both. reversal of all of that, but we've seen both over yeah. the last month, haven't we? Yeah, and how, how much, what's the give there, at which point they have to intervene on some level? Marilyn Watson's going to weigh in on some of this, particularly around the bond market and the surge high we've seen in yields through much of 2022. The head of global fundamental fixed income strategy over at BlackRock joining us shortly. Let's check in on the equity market for you as we count you down to the up and about a few hours away. Equity futures up eight tenths of one percent on the S&P. <laughs> Isn't that against the law in London? No, no. They you can do down checks. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure that's, that is against the law. You're the FTSE in New York. No, City of London rules. <laughs> City of London rules. <laughs> Sir Farrell. <laughs> Live from London, a nation in the morning. Good afternoon to you from London alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Checking the markets for you with equity futures pushing higher, building on the gains of yesterday in the equity market on the S&P 500. We climb higher by eight tenths of one percent. Yields lower by five or six basis points on a 10 year 326.20. Any other day we'd be making a much bigger deal of this, but the dollar weakness out there well, just snapping back in, Tom, <laughs> snapping back in after a really solid charge it's clumsy for the dollar. in the path through the weekend and into next week towards the queen's funeral will have us balanced between a bloomberg surveillance world and this worldwide mourning for uh, the monarch and i i think we're practicing doing it it's hard to go from dollar yen over to discussion of the future certainly of the United kingdom i think one thing we can discuss though is just the change to the sequencing the events the schedule that we expected to have next week a prime example of that is the bank of england sterling at the moment at 115.80 much anticipated rate decision was due to come on september 15th we now understand yep. according to the bank of england the mpc will delay that decision tom to september 22nd so just a shift in the schedule, but ultimately some big decisions still need to be made Good from policymakers in this country. In honor of Dr. O'Leary and on a game theory basis, critically one day after the Fed meeting, I think that's a huge deal. They will have the guidance to work with from the Powell press conference. Can you imagine a month? I think we can imagine quite easily a month now where we've had 75 basis points right. from the ECB, that we get 75 basis points from the <clears> Federal <throat> Reserve, and perhaps even a day later, Tom, 
We get 75 basis points from the Bank of England. One thing that I'll be very interested to see, and Lisa's done a brilliant job of pulling this up over the last couple of days, massive intervention from the state to basically cap energy bills. I wonder what that means for their outlook for inflation over the next couple of years, and in turn, what it means for their outlook for interest rates as well. Well, again, it goes over to the fiscal balance sheet away from price change, and that's, that's the way the theory works, but this has been a year where theory hasn't worked. She is steeped in theory. Marilyn Watson joins us now, head of global fundamental fixed income strategy at BlackRock. Marilyn, not to make the pun of the moment, but which rock do I hide under right now? I mean, within a bond portfolio is a simple solution to shorten duration? So I think, um, as you say, there are a lot of uh, moving parts at the moment, um, particularly as we have the ECB, we've got the Fed coming up um, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, obviously, the Bank of England have shifted slightly out um, their date as well. But we are seeing a lot of volatility in the markets at the moment. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there in terms of where do you find uh, some yields, where do you find uh, maybe a little bit of safety in the markets. I certainly think now the shifts that we've seen in terms of yield and in terms of spread, we do see a lot more attractive carry in the market, whether it's uh, in U.S. duration. Um, you know, we've seen obviously rates there to get the front end, um, you know, shift significantly. And I do think if you're looking sort of at the front end in terms of quality carry, then now I do think there are some very attractive areas for you to invest in fixed income. But we are expecting to see this continued volatility going forward over the next few months, as we have inflation still incredibly high in the US, uh, in the Eurozone, right. in and elsewhere, um, and a lot of decisions to be made. On a nonlinear basis, the path from under 2% on a 10-year yield in March, and up we go. If we do break out where many expect to go, three and a half. 3.65, 3.9% 10-year yield. How does that change your world? So it doesn't change it that significantly in the fact that I think we, among with many other investors, are still relatively cautious around the rate path going forward in terms of where the peak might be in terms of rates. We expect it to peak, the terminal rate to be maybe around just under 4%. But I think um, looking at the path now, if, you're, if you do see a little bit of a spread there in terms of where the terminal rate might be and where the top of uh, the yield might be, I think you know, we're, we're expecting that. We're expecting volatility. I think a lot of the investors are expecting the same as well. We do, still still have a lot of money invested um, you know, in very safe assets. We have money still on the sidelines in terms of cash. We do expect to see a lot more supply going forward. We see, expect to see a lot of opportunities, actually. So I think... You know, looking at the market at the moment, as we do have you know, quantitative tightening going on, as the, you know, the Fed is reducing its balance sheet, as rates continue to rise in the U.S. and elsewhere, we can actually use this volatility to take advantage of valuations where we see them. So let's talk about some of the guides that you use, Marilyn, when you're looking for opportunities at a time when we have inflation that may, just may, come down to 8.1% in the euro region, or that's the expectation on average, and then go down to 2.8% several years from now. This is the baseline, and some would say even optimistic, projection from the ECB. We've got the same kind of talk from the Federal Reserve. How do you factor inflation into your forecast? Is that the reason why you're underweight duration, or is it the fiscal response that really has your attention? Um, so it's both. And I think the, the fiscal um, um, packages that you mentioned and the fiscal response are going to play into um, inflation going forward as well. And potentially they might make the job of central banks that a little bit harder if we do have you know, these very sizable packages that we're seeing um, coming through from the UK, um, the US and you know, in the Eurozone as well. Inflation does play obviously a very key role in terms of um, you know, central bank monetary policy, but also obviously the yields of bonds going forward. And it is something that we do pay very keen attention to. Here in the US, obviously next week, we have some very significant data coming out in terms of inflation, CPI, PPI, and the Fed will obviously be paying very close attention to those as it then goes into the following week, its monetary policy stance announcement. The Fed have announced that they are going to continue to be very aggressive in terms of trying to get inflation back down towards their 2% target. And so inflation does play a very key role. And I think at the moment, in terms of central banks, they're also very concerned about credibility and the fact that you know investors, they don't want investors to be anchored in high inflation expectations. It's very important for them 
for investors and for the market to see inflation coming down and to view the credibility of central banks in bringing that inflation rate down. Um, and I think that is absolutely critical. Marilyn, when you talk about the idea of credibility, we talk about the idea that the ECB is not projecting a recession, even as they get inflation down at a time when even the CEO of Deutsche Bank is saying that a recession is all but inevitable in Europe's biggest economy. How, what does that do for their credibility, that we are not hearing the recession calls from the central bank to a Wall Street, to a city in London, to the rest of Europe that's seeing a very different picture? Yeah, so I think in terms of the credibility, the very aggressive hawkish stance that uh, they took yesterday in terms of raising rates by 75 basis points by announcing that they're going to continue to raise rates on a pretty aggressive path. Um, they mentioned they referenced maybe two to five meetings um, and they referenced that they could go above the terminal rate. So they were, in terms of the rhetoric and the decisions that they made yesterday, relatively hawkish. However, I think it took a lot of the market by surprise that the growth forecasts, particularly for this year, were much higher than I think a lot of people expected, and next year, still a very positive um, number, um, are by much lower in terms of GDP. I think there's just so much uncertainty out there. I do think there's a lag in terms of some of the data coming through for the Eurozone GDP numbers. Um, but the huge amount of uncertainty that we have yet to see as we go into winter in terms of the impact of um, energy prices, um, that will have, you know, potentially a negative impact um, on GDP further and more that has been priced in at the moment. I think that's the difficulty. So if you were to have a fan chart, I think you'd see it would be very, very wide in terms of what the ECB was projecting. But that middle number, um, I think, yeah, aiming, potentially they're aiming maybe for a positive, for a positive number. But I think the risk of uncertainty is very, very high at the moment. Marilyn Watson of BlackRock. Marilyn, thank you. Marilyn, thank you. Right now, we're getting tributes to the late Queen in Parliament. Let's drop by and take a listen. Cheer up the nation. How to lead a celebration. I remember her innocent joy more than 10 years ago after the opening ceremony of the London Olympics when I told her that the leader of a friendly Middle Eastern country seemed actually to believe that she had jumped out of a helicopter... <laughs> in a pink dress and parachuted into the stadium. And I remember her equal pleasure on being told just a few weeks ago that she had been a smash hit in her performance with Paddington Bear. And perhaps more importantly, she knew how to keep us going when times were toughest. In 1940, when this country and this democracy faced the real possibility of extinction, she gave a broadcast, aged only 14, that was intended to reassure the children of Britain. She said then, we know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. She was right. And she was right again in the darkest days of the COVID pand pandemic when she came on our screens and told us that we would meet again. And we did. And I know I speak for other Prime Ministers when I say ex-Prime Ministers, when I say that she helped to comfort and guide us as well as the nation because she had the patience and the sense of history to see that troubles come and go and that disasters are seldom as bad as they seem. And it was that indomitability, that humour, that work ethic and that sense of history which together made her Elizabeth the Great. And when I call her that, I should add one, Elizabeth the Great, I should add one final quality, of course, which was her humility. Her single bar electric fire Tupperware using refusal to be grand. And unlike us politicians, with our outriders and our armour-plated convoys, I can tell you, as a direct eyewitness, that she drove herself in her own car with no detectives and no bodyguard, bouncing at alarming speed <laughs> over the Scottish landscape to the total amazement of the ramblers and the tourists we encountered. And it is that indomitable spirit with which she created the modern 
constitutional monarchy. An institution so strong and so happy and so well understood, not just in this country, but in the Commonwealth and around the world, that the succession has already seamlessly taken place. And I believe she would regard it as her own highest achievement, that her son, Charles III, will clearly and amply follow her own extraordinary standards of duty and service. Yes. And the fact that today we can say with such confidence, God save the King, is a tribute to him, but above all to Elizabeth the Great, who worked so hard. The former the Prime Minister Boris Johnson paying tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. Tom, I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday there was a story passed so around about Queen Elizabeth and, and her driving, which is something that Boris Johnson's mm -hmm. speaking to right now. The story about her driving a member of the Saudi royal family in her Land Rover around one of these estates. And of course, at the time, it was illegal for a female to drive in Saudi Arabia. And obviously, she sits there in the driving seat and the member of the royal family is, is concerned, to say the least. And what does she do? Pow, as fast as she can. And, well, the, and the guy in the passenger seat, got very scared. She had a, um, a reputation for driving those cars very quickly. I believe it started in <laughs> World War II, and this is important. It's an iconic photo, and the young lady was a mechanic, except it was serious. She was actually, it wasn't like a photo op. It was a real skill. Yeah, some brilliant stories, like, Lisa. Like she wouldn't drop the screw down the Chrysler engine distributor this like This sounds I like did. something yeah, you did. something so. I did. I think that's Tom projecting, Lisa. <laughs> she was uh, not the stereotype of simply a dainty queen who didn't want to get her hands dirty. And I love the images of her with her horses and her dogs, with their paws up on her, just absolutely in heaven, because that's where she lived. There'll be more tributes to the queen, no doubt, in the coming nine, ten days, and we'll bring some of those tributes to you. I happy to say that joining us now from Brussels is our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo. And as we've said repeatedly through today, Europe's got work to do, even if a lot of it has to stop for a while. Maria, talk to me about the work being done in Brussels today. Uh, well, Jonathan, there is a meeting which is still going on, and I can tell you I've been here since 8 a.m., and this is still going now uh, for hours. This is energy ministers. Remember, this uh, emergency meeting was called a week ago when it really did feel the energy market in Europe was about to break. Now, the idea, the goal uh, in this meeting, of course, was to stabilize uh, the market, to bring down prices. We know that European energy ministers have been talking about a cap on Russian gas, but what I hear is that inside the room at this stage, there is no deal, there is no agreement, and in fact, I had a contact who told me, if I were you, I would really tone down the expectations because this is still a long road ahead. And what I understand is essentially the issue here is there's an active debate in terms of should you put a price cap on all gas? These are European countries that trade with each other, or should you just do it on Russian gas? That would affect countries like Germany, but it's a very small percentage. But overall, you know, strip away the jargon, what it shows is that Europe right. has a big problem, but they don't have a solution. <clears throat> Maria, you're a font of wisdom in reading in Brussels about what the experts tell the politicians. Do the economists agree that a price cap is efficacious? Look, it depends uh, who you ask. And I think also at this point, uh, you do see a clash between the economics and the politics here. The politicians have also to deal or they worry about potentially uh, social unrest going in the winter. They have to sell this uh, to their populations. They have to show that the effort, the bills that they pay, uh, they go to something that is uh, helping Ukraine, that is freedom, is European uh, values. Also, when you talk to the different countries, they have a very different assessment. So I think at this stage, the issue is... These are 27 different countries. Tom, we talk about the European energy market, but the reality is when you know this market, you know that it's not true. There isn't a European energy market. There's 27 different countries that have 27 different uh, energy uh, mix. They have they use different things. They use different resources. So bringing them all together with a solution that fits all is frankly very difficult. Maria, to that point, the fact that there is not a European energy crisis, but a specific Germany and Italy and France crisis, is this really an energy challenge for most nations and a German energy crisis? Is that really what we're talking about? 
Well, it is for Germany because this is the biggest economy. It's It, it would be, uh, well, incredibly naive uh, to think that the euro area can go by with the biggest economy and export uh, machine going into recession. Everyone here understands. And I know sometimes we talked about the revenge of the southern European countries. Well, I can tell you very well they do not want Germany to go into a recession because this would have ripple down effects on everyone else. It would also have it on the FX. It would have it on the euro, uh, too. They don't want to see that. But listen, you made a very good point. When you look at Germany, this is a gas crisis. When you look at the French, this is a nuclear electricity crisis. That is fundamentally the issue here. You're looking at a market that is being hit from all sides by different reasons. So finding a solution that works for all, it is incredibly hard. And plus, on top of that, you need to be able to sell it politically at home. Maria. Thank you. Maria today out of Brussels. I have to say where Maria is right now in Brussels, Tom, in Belgium. The Belgians have been most upfront about some of the risks on the table here. The duration, how long this could go on for, not just one winter, but potentially five, perhaps even more. And also the prospect of a sudden stop to the economy if this whole well, energy crisis gets a whole lot worse. We're hearing that kind of language from the Belgians, and I don't think we're hearing that elsewhere in quite the same way. The backdrop to me on this as well, and it speaks to King Charles III's effort on climate change and what the British have done there, frankly, with Prime Minister Johnson's effort, I should point out as well, is the idea of what do we do forward on energy in Europe. It was something to, to be in the plane and see Rotterdam to the east. When you look at Rotterdam coal in the last year, that's something no one, including uh, the government of the United Kingdom, expected 12 months Did ago. Did your flight go over Rotterdam? No, no. Did you go a different way? No, no. We, we went in. I, I don't even know the airport. To, just it was trying to, north. Once he said it, I said, like, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> no, I looked at the window and I, I said, is that Gatwick? And they said, no. You got confused. They said it was... Rotterdam. No, no. I just was looking at Rotterdam because of Rotterdam coal. And okay. whether it's Nat gas or it's Rotterdam coal or Newcastle coal, which is in Australia, not near Perth, though. <laughs> But if you look at all these different stories, none of this a year ago was a discussion. You know, Lisa, I, you want to translate? I'm going to just pivot completely. I'm not going to translate. I'm not even going to attempt to. I'm just going to take this in a little bit of a slightly different direction, which is talking about the different crises. What are the different solutions and are they market based? And I think about the fact I keep going back to this, that gasoline in the United States has fallen for 86 <clears throat> consecutive days. Is this because of demand destruction that will lead to lower energy prices naturally? Or is this due <clears throat> to an artificiality uh, by the government in terms of right. opening up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? One of our favorite guests is Darway Kung, portfolio manager, head of commodities at DWS with terrific experience in commodities and particularly away from the usual four stories we talk about in the West. He's truly global, truly encyclopedic. What is the story, Darway, right now in commodities that you don't hear in the media? What is the backstory for the fourth quarter of 2022? Well, clearly, the energy part is a very big part of the commodity market. And what's going on in Europe today um, really is a result of the fact that there's less gas available now. Uh, Russian gas is not being delivered to Europe. But we should focus more, not just in the immediate situation, but also what happens after this winter. In some ways, Europe has been very lucky this year. Uh, the, the drought condition from 2021 did not repeat itself in Asia. So there's more available liquid natural gas for Europe because Asian demand went down earlier part of the summer. That may not repeat next year, given how droughts are affecting China today. And as well as the COVID-19 situation in China actually reduced energy demand for China. And we may actually see oil demand for China actually have a year or right. decline result. And that's actually very healthy <clears throat> for Europe this year. Um, I'm not sure if that will repeat again next year. Right. Darby, did that great observation, and John Farrell mentioned this an hour and a half ago or so, we really don't know the winter is that is coming in Europe. How naive are we about what cold actually does to your world? Uh, clearly, it would cause the energy price to spike if the demand suddenly increases because of the weather condition. Uh, and there's limited amount of switching that could be available to Europe at this point. We anticipate coal burning power plant to be maximally utilized this winter, just like last winter. And 
um, when we see that situation, the only way for Europe to get through that is to reduce demand somehow, reduce activities, rationing energy, which would mean direct impact to their economy. Sorry, I remember when we talked with you uh, earlier this year and you said you could see oil prices climbing, crude uh, climbing beyond $150 a barrel uh, or beyond in the wake of some of the concerns about supply. We now have had a supply cut by OPEC plus members on the prospect of weaker demand. Do you stand by some of those earlier forecasts or do you think that the likelihood of recession in a number of different regions has completely changed the landscape? Well, there are a couple of things that's realized now compared to what I said earlier. Uh, I, earlier around uh, early March, it was not very clear how much of the oil from Russia could actually get exported. And now we know uh, much less uh, were disrupted. We were anticipating two and a half million barrels per day potentially could be uh, disrupted through sanction. That did not occur. In fact, Russia has been able to export most of the oil it produces, and we think less than 900,000 barrels per day is uh, disrupted. And secondly, the COVID situation in China has been very severe in the sense the government lockdown um, has been very thorough and very enduring. And that has caused the demand from China to go down. And then higher prices outside of China has also curbed the demand. We've seen actual demand decline year over year from um, gasoline consumption perspective, and that's very significant. Um, so the demand change plus the ability for Russia to continue to export uh, really resulted in the price movement that we see. Of course, SPR does help as well for now. At some point, U.S. government has to buy back SPR, which will reverse out of fact. Dawei, you're one of our favorites. Thanks for being with us, sir. Dawei Kang there of oh, DWS on the energy situation. Javier Blas wrote on Bloomberg Opinion today, and I'm sure many of you follow the work Mr. of Javier Blas. Please. Brilliant. It was on Liz Truss's plan. Whether you agree with this or not, he raises um, some important questions. Let's put it that way. I'll quote him. Truss's policy falls short. Does it focus on poor and working class families, maintain the semblance of a market to curb demand, identify the cost and a way to pay for it? No, no, and no. Javier Blas out on Bloomberg Opinion this morning, Tom. It is supply side economics. I'm not going to go into it now because honestly, my brain can't do it. It's you know I, I defer to Glenn Hubbard here, who I think is absolutely brilliant on this, and that you've got to provide market incentives. And to Mr. Bloss's point, where are the market incentives of a fiscal or a hydrocarbon policy that directly helps the people that need it most? We haven't heard that yet. Well, maybe, to have his maybe point, we will. To, to be have fair. his point, Tom, because it's not targeted. Let's take a very very wealthy family who have just had their energy bills capped by the government and then can go on consuming as much energy as they like knowing that even if prices go higher I thought that was a bit the odd. government's going to pay for it. I was it. hoping sort of that I missed something there but you, I don't, you, you haven't I have and, and I, I <laughs> yeah. felt the same way Tom and Lisa to really calibrate this I think the the view that came up repeatedly ahead of time before it was unveiled because so much of this was leaked was if you're going to do this surely you should a <clears> make it more targeted and if you don't be do something about curtailing demand well, this is the reason why it's so interesting that Darwei Kung, who had a very bullish view on oil earlier this year, is coming out and saying, actually, the demand destruction was more than perhaps he had previously expected. And we heard from Ed Morris, this is the market doing its job. People restraining some of their use, their consumption of energy in these, so in these forms. So at what point do you end up creating a spiral uh, yeah, that just is costly without any kind of ramification that will be longer lasting and beneficial? I'm not one to do a look back, but I think here the call is so important that Will Kennedy and his team need to do a look back of the strategists like Edward Morris at Citigroup that absolutely nailed this call of lower oil prices. Well, you know the new call from Ed Moss? It's not on oil prices. What he had to say to us on the last week mm. on energy prices in Europe and how many years, Lisa, it would take to get them back to where they were in 2021. It is going to be a difficult and very long project, years long. Got a decent rally here on S&P 500 futures, up 7 tenths of 1%. City of London got in touch, the square mile. No down checks. Got an IB, it's confirmed. Really? No doubt checks, no doubt checks, no mention.
Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. I had the opportunity to meet her before she passed, and she was an incredibly gracious and decent woman. She served us all with strength and wisdom for 70 years. Her Majesty was a rare and reassuring constant amidst rapid change. She was the very spirit of Great Britain, and that spirit will endure. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The tributes pour in as a nation mourns its longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, from London. For our audience worldwide, good afternoon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Being conducted right now, Tom Keane, a 96 gun salute, one shot for every year of the late Queen's life. The tradition here is the death gun salute, and it is all across this United Kingdom. I'm sure there'll be imagery in a couple days to show the span of the United Kingdom, the geography, and the honor of these military forces uh, saluting their queen. And of course, the attachment here of Prince Philip to the military through the Navy uh, is noted, but also the children and grandchildren of Queen Elizabeth. So there's a huge linkage here. I, I would suggest John, this is symbolism that goes beyond other moments we've seen this in British history. Elisa, the first day of 10 days of mourning for this country. And the gun salute's happening not just in the city of London with Hyde Park and Woolwich Barracks and the Tower of London, but also beyond in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. And this really raises the theme that we have heard from everyone this morning who has talked about the late uh, Queen Elizabeth, that she was a uniter. And she united uh, the United Kingdom in a way that few others have. Also in the last 10 minutes or so, confirmation, Tom, that the president, Joe Biden, will attend the Queen's oh, funeral. That. Getting that from NBC, that report coming out about 10 minutes ago. This will be extraordinary. And again, the imagery for Bloomberg Radio Worldwide, uh, wonderful camera work by our different feeds here with London Bridge in the background uh, on the, uh, uh, the Thames. And uh, also, John, I believe we saw the Tower of London. First. There, there's a lot of, a lot of, any huge number of images here. Maybe Portsmouth we're seeing now. Tom, it's amazing to see a country that's prepared for this to happen and then just feel totally surprised and unprepared for it. One person, one friend reached out to me yesterday and said, this figurehead ensured national identity and dignity distinct from politics. And I think for me personally and for many others too, that's mm -hmm. something you only come to appreciate much later in life. And particularly, I think that's really punctuated with her passing in the last 24 hours. My shock, it happened to be the Telegraph, Lisa, was to see up atop where they announced King Charles III and to see that in a font, in type, of the Charles I and II of the 17th century, it shocked me to see that. And yet, of course, it should be. And from a U.S. view, I was speaking to my father, who remembers the day that she was coronated oh, queen, cool. and mm -hmm. that they had to actually ship film over from the United Kingdom to the United States to place it on the reels for days, and that is what everybody watched. So John's giving you a sense of just what the reach was and the importance even back then. Well, we can get some team coverage for you right now. Bloomberg Sky Johnson from outside Buckingham Palace, Amory Hordern down in Washington, D.C. Guy, we've gone back and forth on this a lot together. I think we've both been anticipating a moment and the country hoping it would never come. It's here. Walk me through the next week now and what was on the schedule and now what's largely off the schedule. Uh, well, what is on the schedule is a series of ceremonial events. John, I can hear the guns firing. They're, they're just up the road from me here in Hyde Park Corner. Seven Royal Horse Artillery, the ceremonial arm of the Royal Regiment of Artillery, firing those guns, as you say, 96 shots will be fired, uh, marking the lifespan of Queen Elizabeth II. We're going to see a lot of ceremony like that uh, building up ultimately, and we'll get more details over the next day or so, probably tomorrow, uh, about the funeral that will take place in 10 days' time. That will be a national holiday. That will be a market holiday if it falls on a weekday, John. Um, in the meantime, there will be a series of ceremonial events that will take place as well. The Accession Council will meet formally um, putting forward uh, King Charles as the, as the monarch. Uh, he is obviously already the monarch, but that will formalise that process. Uh, we will see Parliament return. Uh, they will swear allegiance uh, to the king. Uh, they will effectively have a vote 
uh, pushing uh, and making the king the king uh, and, and Parliament's recognition uh, of that. Uh, so a series of ceremonial events will take place. The Queen will go to Edinburgh. She will ultimately come down here to London uh, and lie in rest. The public will be able to gather and pay their respects to her. So a whole series of events that are going to take place, a transition of power ultimately. This evening we will hear from King Charles III. Uh, that will take place. That speech will be delivered at 6 p.m. London time. Guy, do we know where the family is? Beneath King Charles, the brothers, the sisters, the children, the grandchildren, do we know where they are on this first day of mourning? They're all migrating back down south from the Highlands, the Highlands home of the royal family up at Balmoral. They gathered there for the passing of the Queen, Tom, uh, and they will then come down ultimately to the seat of power here in London, Buckingham Palace behind me. Quite literally a changing of the guards taking place here. Um, you talked about your jigsaw puzzle a little bit earlier on. That is what is taking place here. They will, they will come back down here. Charles will start the process of his role within this incredibly sim, sim, sort of symbolistic um, and, and orchestrated process. A lot of symbolism surrounding it, a, a lot of history uh, that is going to be involved in that process. He is the figure here. He is ultimately in charge now uh, of all of this. Uh, he, will, he will meet with the Norfolks. They will, between them, decide how this, is, this process is going to work, the details of the funeral. These are his decisions now, and he will come back here and make those decisions. Anne-Marie, from the United States' perspective, we did learn that President Biden is going to attend the Queen's funeral. Uh, he talked fondly about his experiences with her. We know that she had uh, quite a relationship also with the Obama family uh, and many other presidents. I believe it was 14 that she uh, was the Queen through. I'm wondering what this means in terms of the U.S.-U.K. relationship, how this sort of crystallized that over the years, considering that it is considered a non-political job and yet, in some ways, is one of the key ambassadorial roles. And also the key to that role was Queen Elizabeth II. She was the constant, as you mentioned, in these 14 presidential administrations that she had a relationship with. The only individual she didn't personally meet was Lyndon B. Johnson, but it started out when she was a princess and she stayed at Blair House because the White House was undergoing renovations under Truman, that this relationship between Queen Elizabeth II and these presidents started. There's tons of memories that you heard an outpouring, whether it was Senator Schumer talking about the fact that she was the first British monarch to give a joint address to Congress. And then obviously, lastly, President Biden saw her just last summer uh, with First Lady Jill Biden at Windsor Castle. And there was just an outpouring of love. And, and I think this summed it up in the president's statement yesterday. She was a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy who deepened the bedrock alliance between the United Kingdom and the United States. She helped make our relationship special. Getting to your point, Lisa, this quote-unquote special relationship, this was something that all presidents really found fondness with the Queen. And, of course, it comes at the backdrop of a difficult moment politically and economically for the United Kingdom with this new prime minister that's being ushered in and what she is facing, which is double-digit inflation, a potential recession, and sky-high energy bills. A new leadership in more ways than one over the last week in this country. Amory, just to wrap things up, have you got a decent picture yet of who from Washington will be attending this funeral in the coming week or so? Well, the president said yesterday to a Daily Mail reporter as he was leaving the DNC, where he started those political remarks about the midterms, talking about Queen Elizabeth II, that yes, probably he'll be going, and NBC is reporting that. So it'll be him and the First Lady. We do have Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was just in Kiev yesterday, in Brussels today, meeting with Jens Stoltenberg of NATO. He's already in Brussels. I imagine potentially he would also be attending, maybe the vice president. We don't know. This is speculation. But obviously Obviously, the U.S. is going to want to send a very strong message at this moment. AMH, thank you. Anne-Marie down in Washington. Guy Johnson outside of Buckingham Palace. As Guy pointed out moments ago, an address from the king, a telephone address at 6 p.m. Local time, Tom. So that's 1 p.m. Eastern time. Get that one in the diary. King Charles will be addressing the nation, Tom, a little bit later. In the world, I would suggest, John, much more than that. It will be addressing, the Commonwealth, sure. But addressing uh, the world, and as we heard from Robin Niblett, there's a terrific mystery here. I mentioned the New Yorker magazine article of the last 48 hours. 
there's a terrific mystery here of who this new King Charles III will be. What was interesting about what Sir Robin had to say is how assertive a Prince Charles was on certain issues. On architecture, you mentioned. Specifically, and other topics too. And Lisa, perhaps how, as king, he will have to take a step back and become a different kind of person. Right, much more of a diplomat, someone towing the line and not necessarily putting forward his own agenda, but celebrating the agenda of others and pushing it forward. What I am curious to see is the role of Prince William, who will be the inevitable follower on to Prince Charles III and who will come on because Prince Charles is the oldest uh, person to ascend to the monarchy. So what will his role be? What will he push forward? Where is his popularity in this too? Do you think Chairman Powell would like to schedule an address? That was a joke. I'm not going there. Maybe it's too early to Maybe soon. Maybe he'll just Chairman postpone Powell the meeting. Chairman Powell wants to program with someone else, John, <laughs> a bit later. <laughs> Hey. We should explain to our audience on radio oh, and know. television. <laughs> they so already know. know. Come on, they already know. Lisa Bramwitz, John Farrow, and I, that in this good spirit and a huge part of our team joining us in London for these 10 days, I must say uh, there's a bit of sleep deprivation <laughs> this Friday. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with that. The reason they canceled the soccer, we were going to go to see Manchester City tots, and we knew we'd that, not that have been a sleep. big game. That would have been a big <laughs> that game. Been a good game. Don't give us away. No one could tell, Tom. <laughs> no one could tell. <laughs> no one <laughs> here in London. John, take us out. Coming up, Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president, on Chairman Powell's questionable scheduling over the last 24 hours and a whole lot more. From New York and London and worldwide, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The face of the United Kingdom is changing. Within hours, Charles will be formally proclaimed king in a ceremony dating back hundreds of years. He is succeeding his mother, who was the country's longest reigning monarch, when she died Thursday at the age of 96. Her death set off a 10-day mourning period that will end with a state funeral at Westminster Abbey. European Union energy ministers hold an emergency meeting in Brussels today. They'll discuss the first political steps on how to prevent Russia's cutoff of energy supplies from leading to rationing, blackouts or even social unrest. The EU is considering a series of radical plans to tame runaway energy prices and keep the lights on. King Jong Un is raising the stakes for any military confrontation with the U.S. and its allies. Kim expanded the circumstances under which North Korea would launch a nuclear strike. North Korea listed five conditions for using weapons of mass destruction. One of them is if Kim's leadership is threatened. The U.S. Justice Department will appeal a judge's order for a special master to review documents seized from Donald Trump's Florida home. Federal prosecutors say the ruling has thwarted a review of potential national security impact. They also want to continue using the classified materials as part of an ongoing criminal investigation. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Think what we asked of her and think what she gave. She showed the world not just how to reign over a people, she showed the world how to give, how to love, and how to serve. And as we look back at that vast arc of service, its sheer duration is almost impossible to take in. A beautiful tribute in Parliament from the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson just moments ago, a tribute to Britain's longest reigning monarch. Live from London, good afternoon to you. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. We're on about an hour and 12 minutes away from the opening bell in New York City. The state of things in financial markets looks a little something like this. Equity futures bouncing back the last couple of days. We add to it by about 30 points on the S&P 500, up 29, up 7 tenths of 1%. Yields back in, lower, down, negative four basis points on a 10-year to 327.53. Bit of dollar weakness out there, Tom. Euro dollar 10042. Euro dollar, that currency pair positive, almost half of 1%. One of great inventions the Bloomberg financial conditions index John shows a more accommodative less restrictive state of financial conditions that's not what Chairman Powell wants. Is that an unwarranted easing of financial conditions would you say? I would suggest it is something worth watching into the weekend and into 
the Monday open. You know who we need to call? 1-800-Kashgari. Wait, uh, who wait, likes to watch somehow. the commentary, Grammo, <laughs> and whether the market should be where the market is. I think Tom is about to offer forward guidance. I think that that's illegal. So I is do think, though... Soon? Is Kashkari speaking yeah. Saturday, Sunday, and <laughs> yeah, Monday? So, exactly. Well be. Oh, but, we just as well. And we're thrilled that you're with us, folks, on radio and television. Uh, and as we begin this 10 days of mourning and our commitment to London here with Bloomberg Surveillance, it is good to speak to the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg, John Micklethwaite. And what is important here is his commitment to the literature with Adrian Woldridge and the number of books that they have put out over the years. I want to go to a what if, John, because we do not know the schedule forward. There is, and the first time I walked into it, I fell apart, Westminster Hall. Not Westminster Abbey, mm -hmm. but this small hall right next to it that, that one person on a night in 1941 said, we need to save Westminster Hall, let the commons burn. And there has to be some heritage there, some symbolism as you mourn your queen. Well, I think Westminster Hall also was the place, as I remember it, and I may have got this wrong, that I think Charles I went to shortly before he was executed, and there have been countless other people. So it is, it is actually very um, related to the monarchy and to British history, and so it's right at the middle of things. I do think, actually, strangely, in this case, I think there is something very... Um, your sense of history, Tom, is correct, is that there is something at this precise moment very sort of historical about this. And there's also a sense of the monarchy from an earlier age. If you look at the inheritance from Charles's point of view, he is coming into a kingdom that um, is in danger of breaking up. He is coming into a kingdom that has got poor relations with its ancestral um, other half in, in France and Germany and things like that. Mm -hmm. And he's also got a, a sort of brand new chancellor, if you want, under the old terms, in Liz Truss. So there is a, there, it's, a, it's a not easy inheritance. And I think in terms of history, from the monarchy's point of view, um, this is an unusually difficult time, notwithstanding the, the, the huge amount of coming together that is happening at the moment. John, how do you expect that he is going to reposition this monarchy in the world that you describe? I think, I think it's a mixture between trying to keep the, the inherent strength that, that his mother had, which was the ability to bring people together. You and I just talking before, you could come from wildly different backgrounds in this country. You could come from wildly different races, genders, everything. And people saw this woman as a center of what this country was about. And in terms of international influence, she was, she was about as strong as soft power can get. Everybody you met around the world, doesn't matter, even you know, talking to rulers in Asia last couple of weeks ago, they are still fascinated by this woman who has, after all, met everybody or did meet everybody. And so as a kind of weapon of soft power, she was extraordinary. Now you have a new person coming in. And I think for Charles, the sort of challenge is possibly to step back a little bit in terms of his advocacy. He's no longer the heir to the throne. He is actually the, he's, he now is the person at the middle of the English constitution. He selects who the prime minister can be. That, that means you have to perhaps become a slightly more objective figure. But the second thing is, you know, how, how do you update the monarchy quietly um, without losing that sense of, of power? When you talk about updating the monarchy, one thing that Queen Elizabeth II did was that she became an icon of culture. She became, as one historian said, she is Tower Bridge and a red double-decker bus on two legs, not to mention Big Ben, afternoon tea, village vets and sheep flecked hills. How much can the new uh, king, King Charles II, really move at a point uh, to King Charles III, come out and actually uh, represent something cultural? And if not, what relevancy will this monarchy have? It's quite interesting. The world in which, I was just thinking whilst you were talking, the world in which John and I grew up, obviously John massively younger than me, but the, but the stamps, <laughs> the basic fact is the thing you were used to seeing was the monarch's head on a stamp. Well, now yeah. we don't see as many stamps. It's difficult to imprint a monarch's head on an email and, and, and issues like that. I do think it is, it's a question of rebranding. When you looked at the um, uh, Jubilee celebrations um, recently in which Charles was right in the middle, you know, there were some things that worked putting great big images on, on top of Buckingham Palace. There were other things which maybe just felt, it was a bit like watching your, your kind of granddad trying to dance. Um, that, that, there, was, there was a little bit of that. So it's a very difficult thing. And at different times, the clever thing about the Queen is she was quite good at letting the junior royals 
go off and try things. There was a famous thing called It's a Knockout, which is too painful to go through, but that where they all dressed out. in medieval costumes and sort of threw <laughs> sponges at each other. But that you was know conveniently you've got to passed off. John, you've got to explain this You know you've got to explain this now. This is amazing, go. It was a kind please. of game show that had appeared on television, which the more I think about it, the less easy it is to defend to any audience that stretches beyond this, this particular kingdom. The, the royals had a game show? They did once, and it did not work out well. So they perhaps that perhaps was something that they didn't went on a game um, show entirely time. work. They were like it was like a guest version for charity, um, but it didn't entirely work. And I cannot remember the full details of it. So please don't, I don't push me too to, hard on it. But John, it's probably it a, was decent not a, place, success. a decent place to pause and reflect just for another moment. There have been times in the history of this royal family, even with Queen Elizabeth on the throne, where they've had difficulty connecting with the British people. Do you think King Charles is going to have that difficulty? And I think of a particular generation very much enamoured with the late Princess Diana, who were uncomfortable with Camilla taking the title of Queen. I think that my personal view is that that has moved on. I remember that very well, but my, my sense is that has moved on. And Charles has sort of pushed himself, notwithstanding certain Netflix series, has pushed himself back into the, and several films, has pushed himself back into the middle and he is he is now a more respected figure than he was then I, but the interesting point is this is that the thing that determines a monarch is that old sort of harold Macmillan thing about events dear boy events you know the it's what it, nobody could have guessed what was going to happen to elizabeth nobody can guess right. what's going to happen to charles yeah. we know he faces some things like the possibility of scotland and northern ireland maybe leaving his union we're here for 10 days do you have a restaurant you like can you give us a close to here, the Bloomberg Pantry stands the Bloomberg out. Bloomberg Pantry, you know, Tom, Tom, Tom was banned from mentioning the Crown on Netflix for our whole time here. In the <laughs> he just got full clearance. John Nichols White there, live from London. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Live from London, good afternoon to you, good morning to you stateside. About an hour away from the opening bell in New York City, the shape of things looks a little something like this on the S&P 500. Decent rally the last couple of days. We had some weight to it on the S&P. We advanced 31 points, up 8 tenths of 1%. Yields lower by 5 basis points, 326.77. 10 days of mourning here in the United Kingdom. We'll be on top of those events for you. A couple of updates so far today. King Charles addressing the nation at 6 p.m., UK time. That's about four and a half hours from now, so look out for that. We were looking ahead to a Bank of England rate decision next week, September 15th. We've learned from the Bank of England that the MPC will postpone that decision, delay it, just the one week. So Tom will get that decision on September 22nd. So a one-week delay from the Bank of England. And an important point here, John, is it's very fluid forward, and as Lisa's mentioned a number of times, not just the morning for this Queen, but the news flow forward into the weekend. And I'd start with the war in Ukraine. It's, it's very flexible. I think it's good we're in London here, given the European story that's out there. Oh, without a doubt. What we see with the morning in the United Kingdom. Tom, inevitably, and this is going to be of no surprise to anybody, the front page of every single newspaper in this country, including the Financial Times, Lisa. Really quite moving. Yeah. Is on the Queen. Yeah. If the Queen had not have died yesterday, I think we can all predict what would have been on the front page of every single newspaper, including the Financial <laughs> Times this morning. Lisa, it would have been on that massive fiscal intervention by the Prime Minister. And the potential consequence for bonds, also for currency, also for credibility of a nation right now struggling to find the right policy response for something very difficult to pinpoint and very difficult to solve. It'll be interesting to see if the early days of trust are delayed until the 20th or 21st. I think they have been already. Yeah. She got a head start, though, Tom, yeah. and I think we need to work through those issues still. Well, let us continue right now with an important essay in truly his professional wheelhouse. William Dudley joins us. He's a former president of the New York Fed, which is a different Fed. And Bill Dudley puts to rest one of the great concerns of the, what I'm going to call collegially the doom and gloom crowd that says, oh, my, oh my God, we're going to have some form of short-term paper crisis, a liquidity crisis, however you want to phrase it. This is the wheelhouse of the New York Fed. Bill Dudley, why do the adults at the New York Fed, including you, you've lived it, why do you disagree with the doom and gloom crew? 
Well, a couple of things that are very different this time. Uh, first of all, the Fed has the experience of last time uh, to go by. Last time they were surprised by the demand of, of banks for reserves, and so they unexpectedly drove the amount of reserves too low relative to banks' demand. That's why you got the spike in repo rates in September 2019. Uh, so they've learned from experience. Uh, second, uh, they put in place a standing repo facility now, which is available just slightly above market rates. So if repo rates were to uh, spike up, banks would turn to the Fed's standing repo facility. So you wouldn't mm -hmm. see a big spike. It would be a little spike this time. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I think you know the Fed's going to be tapering the rate of how its balance sheet uh, shrinks as we get deeper into this process. At first, we're running off $60 billion of treasuries, up to $60 billion of treasuries, and $35 billion of agency MBS each month. Mm -hmm. But once the reserves in the system get to a, a, a significantly lower level, the Fed's going to slow the rate of asset per, uh, runoff. And then right. it's going to stop. It's basically going to stop. It's going to stop before they think we're at that critical point where reserves are too scarce. So he, it, they're going to learn from past experience, and I don't think they're going to make the same, same right. mistakes this time. Bill Dudley, have we done this before? Is the New York Fed down in the basement? It's underneath one of the pizza parlors down in lower Manhattan. Have you done an experiment that says this is going to work, or are you flying blind? Well, I think you did the experiment last time uh, following the great financial crisis. The Fed shrunk its balance sheet, uh, and we had that experience in 2019 where they shrank, shrank it a little too much. Right. So they're going to learn from that episode and not do the things that they did last time. Last time, they, they never slowed the rate of uh, uh, asset runoff. They never stopped the, the asset runoff prior to the, the reserves becoming scarce. And I think the, this time, they didn't have a standing repo facility. So I think this time they have sort of a belt and suspenders, and they didn't have either a belt or suspenders last time. So they have belts and suspenders for a problem that will, won't necessarily repeat itself. But where are the belt and suspenders for a dollar getting too strong for the rest of the world to really sustain its momentum? Well, this is a problem always, that the Fed follows monetary policy based on what's best for the United States, and the consequences of the rest of the world are the consequences for the rest of the world. And a strong dollar is one of the consequences of the Fed tightening monetary policy now quite aggressively. The Fed actually wants the dollar to be relatively firm because a stronger dollar restrains economic activity and it reduces inflation because it reduces the cost of uh, import, imports into the United States. So the Fed is not unhappy with the dollar strength. This is just part and parcel, one aspect of how you tighten financial conditions. That being said, Bill, there has been a lot of discussion about the confluence of tightening around the world, the fact that we got 75 basis points from the ECB, Deutsche Bank now calling for another 75 basis point rate hike by the ECB at the next meeting. We have a Federal Reserve doubling down on their hawkish message. At what point do we see all of these tightening cycles come together in, a, in an effect that we haven't yet priced in that's going to be something significant and could move markets more significantly? Well, I think what everyone's, you know, wondering about is could the central banks, you know, collectively overdo it? Um, my view is that that's a very premature thing to worry about at this point. I mean, look at the federal funds rate in the United States. It's still at 2.33 percent, uh, you know, well, well below what you would consider to be neutral in this current inflation environment. So let's get to a tight monetary policy setting first before we worry about whether the Fed is too tight for too long, uh, as maybe other central banks will ultimately turn out to be. The Fed has made it very clear that this is a that, that they need to make the mistake on the error of getting inflation back down right. to 2%. So they're, so they're going to be tighter for longer than I think people expect. Bill, you said something there that it's too premature. The conversation people are having, wondering, is whether that conversation, that debate becomes a little bit more balanced. When do you think that becomes a little bit more balanced, where people start to worry that they're overdoing it, that they can sit back and say, you know what, that's a valid concern. At the moment, the focus is to front load, all that good stuff, hike, hike, hike. The bigger risk is to do too little, not too much. When do you expect that conversation, that debate is a little bit more balanced than it is right now? Probably, you know, first half of next year when we see rates, you know, 4 percent or higher. Uh, we see the unemployment rate starting to move up, the labor market starting to lose some of the, you know, very strong forward momentum we've seen in payroll employment growth. And, you know, as we see the housing sector continue to weaken, you know, at some point people will start to think about, oh, have, has the Fed actually done enough? Key thing I think to watch is really the status of the U.S. labor market. The U.S. labor market is much too tight to be consistent with 2 percent inflation. Wages at 5 percent plus are much too high to be consistent with 2 percent inflation. So I think those are the things to really focus on. What's happening in the U.S. labor market? 
So, Bill, I'm wondering, looking forward at what the uh, sort of tea leaves are going to be, what about the roll-off of the balance sheet? That has been a big issue, and some people are even talking about the sale of mortgages from the balance sheet and that that could potentially be disruptive. Have you heard anything more on that in the past couple of weeks? I have not. I think that they're unlikely to sell mortgages in the near term for the simple reason that almost all the mortgages they own are uh, now underwater. They're, they're worth less than what the Fed uh, bought them for. The Fed already has a problem that uh, their earnings are going to turn negative uh, as they continue to tighten monetary policy. The return on their assets will be less than the cost of their liabilities. And to exacerbate those losses by selling mortgages and booking losses, uh, I just think that's not going to happen in the near term. Bill Dudley, formerly of the New York Fed and a good friend of this show and of Bloomberg Opinion as well. Bill, thank you. Lisa, some big questions to ask there. What did you want to pick up on? Intervention, coordinated intervention. Well, he was talking about how it's a little too early to say that the, all of the effects come together to talk, to talk about a pause. We've heard so much about coordinated inter intervention about the currency, coordinated intervention to take some sort of pause, and how that's not going to happen because right now the U.S. is benefiting disproportionately sure. from some of these policies. And that, I think, is a fascinating moment, and that's why it's interesting I, that he says it's premature. I got at least three emails this week on are we near a new plaza court? And I do the math. It's some fancy Bloomberg math. I, I'm not going to go into it now. But the bottom line is we are nowhere near the calculus, the first, the second derivative oomph, the inertial force that we saw in 1984. We're nowhere near it. You know how the show often goes. We'll have a conversation and then someone much, much smarter will give us some feedback on what they think. <laughs> so we were talking about Japan yesterday and the BOJ. And I sat here and I said a few times that... If I was the Treasury or the Federal Reserve, my response to the Japanese would be quite simple. If you want a stronger currency, do something about it. You're currently pinning yields down, so-called yield curve control. I believe the upper band of that on a 10-year is 25 basis points. You're keeping rates unchanged. Everyone else is hiking. I think that it's very intuitive to expect, very obvious, to expect a much weaker currency. And someone wrote, and I had a conversation with them, and the point they brought up I thought was really, really important. What do you think is going to happen if they abandon yield curve control tomorrow? What would happen to the global bond market? Is that something that you think the Federal Reserve would like? That would be a rapid tightening of financial conditions in a way that perhaps would be in a disorderly way, unlike what we've seen so far this year. And I thought it was just an important element to think about that we hadn't thought about. I think that that's a really good point. I'm just wrapping my head around this, how the calmness, how the integrity of the financial system <clears throat> is the priority right. for a lot of these central banks over specific moves John, and the magnitude. Let us interrupt on radio, the Queen concert coming out of uh, 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 the, the private aircraft of Prince Charles, I should say the, the United Kingdom's aircraft of Prince Charles. Uh, there is Prince Charles, John, down below uh, as they come back to London. King Charles the third, an address Excuse to the me. nation. King Charles, got to get, got to get used to that, used to haven't it. we? It's going to take a while. It, it, okay, you said but I'm embarrassed. You, you, I'm supposed to not do that. You, but said I did. Something, you said something earlier this morning that I think really resonated with me, Tom, when you said to see it in writing. Shocked. To, to see it in writing. Shocked. Yeah, we've been preparing for this everything. moment for how long? I was and... completely wrong. I was shocked. <laughs> and then you see it in writing, and all of shocked. a sudden it feels so much more real. My book of the summer is on the 17th century, and on Charles one and two, and just to yep. see the three was a shock. Returning to London from Balmoral, the royal family's holiday home up in Scotland, and Lisa will hear from him a little bit later. Yeah. I believe in about, what is it, four hours and 20 minutes from now? 6 p.m., 1 p.m. in New York, am yeah. I guessing 6 right? 6 p.m. local time, Tom, that's right. Interesting to see whether he puts forward some sort of agenda or whether it's just a unifying and somber address representing his mother. Dan Jurgen is going to join us, the vice chairman oh, of S&P Global and author of The New Map and Commanding Heights. That conversation coming up from London. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, it's the end of one era and the beginning of another. Two days after Queen Elizabeth II died following more than seven decades as monarch, her son Charles will be formally proclaimed king. At 73, he is the oldest person to accede to the throne in British history. The UK has begun a 10-day mourning period that ends with the Queen's funeral. It's prompted another, it's the Queen Elizabeth's death has prompted the Bank of England to delay its next interest rate decision a week, and that is September 22nd. Now, the original date fell in the middle of a national mourning period for the Queen. The move gives policymakers more time to consider key inflation and jobs data due to be published next week. 
China is stepping up its defenses against COVID. While chunks of the country remain under tight lockdowns, the government is placing more restrictions on internal travel. The steps seem designed to reduce the risk of outbreaks before next month's Communist Party Congress in Beijing. And that's when President Xi Jinping is expected to secure a precedent-breaking third term in office. Robinhood will distribute information on its users' top stock holdings in a new index. The trading platform is offering a monthly snapshot of the top 100 stocks that its users are holding with the most conviction. Now, Robinhood measures conviction in a stock by looking at how highly concentrated it is across portfolios. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. To you, she was your queen. To us, she was the queen. To us all, she would be with us forever. We will remember and perpetuate the values she never ceased to embody and promote. The moral fortitude of democracy and freedom. A tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth II from Emmanuel Macron, the French president. Pictures coming in now, sent around the world of King Charles III, touching down from Balmoral, Scotland, just moments ago. I'm now heading to Buckingham Palace, where a little bit later on this evening in the United Kingdom, 6 p.m. local time, so 1 p.m. Eastern, <coughs> we'll have an address from the King, Tom, to the nation. And as you've rightly pointed out, Tom, not just the nation, to the world. Well, I think to the world, and it was, is uh, President Biden and Dr. Biden, I believe John, are confirmed to now attend uh, the funeral, and others will. I hearken back to 1963. It's my only equivalent to shock of Charles de Gaulle and Haile Selassie of Ethiopia standing there at Arlington Cemetery, seared in my childhood. I, I don't mean that there's an equivalent there, but at the same time, uh, I, I, I do think that the enormity of what we may see, I believe tentatively scheduled Monday, of next week could be yep. really significant. When is the confirmation of that, Tom? Uh, well, uh, when? When? Waiting for confirmation. We're waiting for, yeah. excuse me, waiting for confirmation to come. This is an honor, and we've had an extraordinary first day. John, Lisa, and I say thank you to our team working around the clock since the death of the Queen to bring you voices of perspective. Daniel Jurgen is with S&P Global, author of a few books on oil, and also definitive the commanding heights, the battle between government and the marketplace, the remaking of a modern world that Queen Elizabeth was so much a part of. Dr. Jurgen, thank you so much for joining us. And I go back to a conversation you and I had after the death of Baroness Thatcher of a funeral you attended with great emotion in London and the politics of Thatcher and such. There was a relationship of the commanding heights of British politics always with the queen. What will that relationship look like forward with a king? Well, this is a king who, of course, is very much part of the modern world. Uh, actually, I went to school with him at, uh, at uh, Cambridge, where he was quite a good student. Uh, the queen, of course, was connected and was, was visible in the stalwart during World War II. So this will be more forward-looking. And Charles has carved out a series of issues that are, uh, that are important to him. But he will, I think, uh, in his regal role, will have to be more measured in, in what he engages in. We spoke with Mohammed Alarian of Queen's College, Cambridge, this morning, and you bring up the linkage here of something that Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip wanted. They wanted educated children. Give us, give us a scope of uh, King Charles III's international view. We know so much of his English services. Give us a scope of his international view. Well, I think he's obviously been very engaged with uh, environmental issues. That's been very much uh, on his agenda. And he's, but he's also just had the job, of, as he travels the world, of representing uh, Britain and representing and being the symbol of the Commonwealth as well. So I think that feeds into it. And I remember... Um, one of our common professors said, you know, that he was a very good student at Cambridge, 
and he would have gotten very top honors, except he had a few other things going, which he had to be invested as the Prince of Wales, and that took some time, took him away from the classroom for a while. They were going to invest you as a prince of oil. Lisa? <laughs> well, Dan, and actually it's one that's very relevant at the moment, given some of the pressing issues at hand, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But when I look at the book title behind you, The New Map, and this question of the new order of things and where the Commonwealth fits in, how do you see the alliances sort of shaping, and what will the new Commonwealth look like? Will it be the United Kingdom? There are so many questions around this unity. Well, Britain is, I mean, is because after Brexit, has to cast itself a new role, uh, remember that role uh, closer to the United States and trying to be, in a sense, an independent global power. But it's doing so at a time when its economy is really in big trouble. Uh, and Liz Truss, the new prime minister, has a very difficult job ahead. It is interesting, by the way, she has embarked on a uh, Thatcher-like program right from the beginning. Uh, definitely, she's made a turn, and it really does invoke uh, the woman who was prime minister the longest in the last century and a half, Margaret Thatcher. So, Dan, you are an uh, expert in all things having to do with oil and energy, and this really is at the epicenter of what you were just talking about in, term, uh, in terms of this Thatcher-esque program. Do you think this is the right solution? How important is it to target what we've been talking about all morning, which is the demand side of things, and dampen it in order to get things more into balance? Well, I think demand has to, you know, has to come down. If you can bring it down 15 percent uh, through almost voluntary response to price and so forth, that can take a lot of pressure off. It's striking how much Russian gas to <clears throat> Europe uh, volumes now are down to 9 and 10 percent when it used to be close to 40 percent. Much depends upon the winter, but once they get the storage filled in Europe, I think that takes some of the pressure off the market. But every government, I just talked to some of the ministers in the different governments, they're all having to rush out financial support to consumers to weather this storm that is just not well perceived in the United States. But it's devastating for people's pocketbooks and the economy in Europe. Uh, Dr. Jurgen, John Farrow has brought up a number of times the failure of Germany and their hydrocarbon policy with Russia. You are definitive about this and indeed led on it in the commanding heights years ago. Let me cut to the chase and use br brutal language. How bad did Germany screw up? Well, I think the big mistake was not having it. It was not. I mean, after the end of the Cold War, Russia's a nuclear power. You had to try and integrate it into the global economy, and energy was one of the ways to do it. I think the big mistake the Germans made were they were confident they would just rely upon that. They didn't build energy security in. They didn't build diversity so that they were overly dependent. I think that was their problem. And I think shutting down nuclear power turns out to have been not a good idea. In fact, reactors that yeah. were going to be shut down at the end of the year they're going to at least keep a couple of them either there for emergencies or maybe keep them operating. Even Japan, after Fukushima, did not close down all of its nuclear power. Dan Jürgen, some questionable decisions from that country over the last decade or so. Dan Jürgen, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I saw someone joke yesterday out on Twitter, and I won't name check them. I'll allow them to do that for themselves the next you name time they're on all the time. TV and radio with, the, with us. They talked about maybe Germany needing to adjust. Um, accept some structural reforms, perhaps even a package, to make sure there's some European solidarity. Now, you can see where I'm going with this. Oh, please do explain. It seems odd to me that Germany is asking for European solidarity on this issue, when they've clearly made some very, very questionable decisions on energy policy and foreign policy alike over the last couple of decades, and sacrifices that countries like Spain might have to make through the winter, when at the height of the debt crisis, the periphery, had to take on a massive amount of structural reforms. Where was the solidarity on the continent 10 years yeah. ago? Well, what you're pointing to is the real tension emerging in the European Union. Is it only good when it's good for us versus sure. something that is more wide sweeping and, and helping people out when they need help? Yeah. Are we doing another hour? I we can, are. Can I go get you, a full You're going to join me for the opening bow. Anastasia Amoroso, Mike Collins, Jonathan Gollop, too, coming up, TK. Yes. Outstanding. Looking forward to it. This is an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz.
Live from London for our audience worldwide. Good afternoon, good afternoon to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow, counting you down to the opening bell. 30 minutes away and equity shaping up as follows. Pushing higher good numbers. on S&P 500. Futures up 7, 8 tenths of 1%. Let's call it higher mm. by 3 quarters of 1%, TK. A decent push higher on the NASDAQ as well, up by one full percentage point. Johnny asked earlier uh, to one of our good equity guests, I said, is this similar to the June? rally that we saw. I got sort of a half answer is what I got. But if I see Dow futures up 214, 32,000 Dow, 4,000 SPX. And what really impressed me off the Gulf Stream was the VIX with a 22 handle. What were the fairy tales the equity bulls were singing through the summer? Ramo, something about a Fed pivot? Yeah, that's pause, right. And then Chairman Powell came out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and said, what pivot? Right. And so then you have people are pushing back and saying, you just don't know it yet, but you're going to be pivoting. <laughs> but why are we up there? Do we <laughs> have a why? Do we have a consensus why we've advanced? No. I mean, you can pretend that there's some sort of narrative. People are basically saying the dollar, the fact that the euro is uh, actually gaining some traction, that there's a better sentiment. You know, if I give a narrative, people will laugh at me and say, are you really going to try to give this something? Because it's very I difficult say, to say. On, on radio, John, this is really important not to sure. slow down the show. An eventful half oh, hour here in a serious tone. Not at all. Here in London, you know, slamming Take the brakes. Take a wide so. shot right now, guys of us. I mean, I'm sorry. This Please looks like don't. the College Bowl, the Prudential College Bowl, <laughs> in like 1964. The College Bowl, University of Alabama, Alabama, Crimson yeah. Tide, Roll Tide, and all that you good know, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm up to. Okay. I'm up to speed. You, you, you know, know that. Let's go. College Bowl was a, a game where you guessed questions, and right, your okay. parents said someday that will be you. Like University Challenge. Yes, yes. Yes. Very good. Which the new Chancellor won a few times, you know. He's quite competent. In I, incredibly, I, incredibly sharp. We're going to stop here. This is important. We this already to did me stop. Is a <laughs> the feature. stoppage already no, happened. John, We're restopping. This is the distinctive feature <laughs> of the moment. This cabinet of Prime Minister Truss is just stunning for the rest of the world. It's going to be really interesting. I think expectations are rock bottom because of the challenge they face. Yeah. And it's a massive challenge at that. And they've come out with a massive, massive solution to it. And Lisa, I think a lot of people are throwing mad at it. Yeah. But it's incredibly ambitious, isn't it? It's Untargeted, uncapped. It's huge. Well, and Dan Jurgen actually was much more delicate than we have been in discussing this plan. Where he basically said, you know, you could say it's infeasible, whatever, but the pain is not similar to what is being experienced in the U.S. when you look at the U.K. and when you look at the European Union when it comes to just the scope of the household pain. Remember when Tom said he didn't want to slow down the show and then slowed down no, the show? No, slow down the show. <laughs> You'll be checking Dow Futures next. Should we stop yeah. again? Let's check those. Dow Futures up <laughs> 204. We started so, out. So, so predictable. Thank you. But pictures <laughs> coming in about 20 minutes ago. Important pictures. King Charles yes. III touching down in England, coming back from Balmoral, Scotland, the royal family's family home, holiday home, up in Scotland. He's now heading to Buckingham Palace, where he'll address the nation, and as Tom pointed out a couple of times in the last few hours, address the world as well. You can see the motorcade heading over to Buckingham Palace right now. I believe we can catch up with Guy Johnson from outside Buckingham Palace and catch up with him and get his thoughts on what we can expect to hear, Guy, in around about four hours time. Uh, I think we're going to expect to hear, and I'm going to use the word again, John, continuity. Uh, he is going to want to calm the nation. He is going to want to talk about uh, his mother. I think that, that will be the bulk of, of what we're going to hear today. He's going to pay homage to his mother. He's going to speak about Queen Elizabeth. He's going to speak about her incredibly fondly. He's going to speak about her achievements. Uh, and he is then going to look forward. He is going to talk about uh, how he is going to build upon that uh, and how he is, he, he is going to work with what she built. She earned right. the respect that she had. He has yet to earn it. He needs to do that, Tom. Guy, not to catch you unawares, and I hope you're, you're read in on this as well and the royal niceties of it. What is the difference between a queen, a queen mother, or a queen consort. What is a queen consort as Camilla uh, listens to her husband, King Charles III, this evening? Um, she has been a very controversial figure in, in British life, in British royalty. The, the, the second wife of uh, Prince Charles, obviously, uh, following the death of Diana. Um, she has, I have to say, if you look at the polling, if you look at the way that she has been treated over the last few years, grown into the role um, and she has gained respect. And I think 
what would have been unachievable a few years ago, Tom, is now achievable, mm -hmm. that she is able to fulfill this role, that she is able right. to step into that role as Queen Consort. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how she grows into the role, but I think the, the, the public's respect and, and uh, feelings for her have changed significantly over the last few years. Guy, not only this afternoon in London on a, a lovely, you know, cloud-filled but not rainy day, what kind of a crowd turnout do you expect and then through the week at different events? Has anyone measured that yet or guesstimated the crowd attendance? Uh, many, Tom. There are many people here. I, I have no idea of the exact numbers. Uh, I've certainly seen this area more uh, more packed, but I suspect that over the next few days the numbers will grow. There yeah. is a steady stream of people around me. Um, I, there, are, there are hundreds of cameras here. Um, we are we are sort of encircling um, Buckingham Palace. Uh, the the mall behind the, the mall behind me. I look over to my right, down towards the mall. Uh, there are many many people here, uh, and those numbers yeah. will continue yeah. to grow over the next few days. Uh, obviously, we'll be watching as as the Queen's body comes down, and people are able to pay their respects uh, and to mourn her directly. Uh, that, that there will be a shift of emphasis or location, but but there are many people here, uh, and that is understandable. This is a, a huge moment in British history. Guy, Prince Charles III, uh, or Prince Charles, was known for trying to push forward a greener energy agenda. That was a really important project to him. We've been talking all morning about how his role as King Charles III will be very different than his role as prince. Yet, a lot of people are wondering what this will do in terms of influencing policy at a time when we're actually moving away from that a little bit globally when it comes to trying to fortify some of the energy sources. What do you expect or what are you hearing on that front? I don't think he will play as a direct role as he had in the past. I think in the past he was certainly trying to, to create space for himself, to create an agenda for himself, trying to explain what he was interested in. Now that he is king, that role changes. It will be interesting, I think, to see what William does. Um, he will assume the Duchy of Cornwall. Will he continue his father's work? Um, the Duchy of Cornwall in many ways has been the launch pad of many of the green agendas and architectural agendas that, that, that King Charles has pushed through uh, as the Prince of Wales. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how his son develops that process, but I think King Charles will be different to Prince Charles. Guy Johnson from Buckingham Palace. I think we're all looking forward to that address from King Charles III a little bit later. Guy, thank you. Building on that, Lisa, it was Craig Vallier of AGF this morning who wrote the following, and thanks to Anne-Marie and DC for passing this on. We've sifted through thousands of words on this, wondering what King Charles III will mean for America and the world. The bottom line is important. He may lead the battle for a radical environmental agenda, which has fallen out of favour as the dominance of fossil fuels continues to be a political and economic necessity. People much closer to the story here in the United Kingdom right now would take a different view on this. And I think what we heard from... So Robin Nisbet, a little bit earlier from Channon House, Tom, was a suggestion that Prince Charles is going to be very, very different to the King Charles we're about to have, which is something Guy echoed just moments ago. Which is interesting because you wonder how this will affect the alliance between President Biden, who's trying to push a similar agenda, and King Charles III, but don't expect the same person as when he was Prince Charles. It evolves. And, I, you know, I'll be honest, folks, I don't have the details in front of me and I don't have a four-inch binder to brief me on it, but Prince William in the Duchess of Cambridge with a primal scream that Lisa and I know moved their three children to a different school district a number of weeks ago. How does that get derailed now? I mean, you wonder about a normal family scream of we want our kids to go to school A versus school B for whatever reason. John, is he looking and at that, me for a reason with uh, children and I've primal screens? No idea. <laughs> but, but seriously, to your point, their lives change with this as well. Massively. Everyone's yeah. lives change. And for yeah. those of you just tuning in, we will have an address from King Charles III. We'll get that at 6 p.m. local time, so that's about 1 p.m. Eastern time. No doubt we'll bring that to you live on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. No doubt you're also interested in the opening bell, which is about 21 minutes away, with equity futures up eight-tenths of 1%. No doubt you're all asking the same question. Can I trust this rally of the last couple of days? Let's try and answer that question for you. iCapital's Anastasia Amoroso joins us right now. Anastasia, can we trust this bounce, this rally.
I wouldn't. I wouldn't just yet. And uh, part of the reason is that we're in a pretty treacherous part of seasonality here. We're in September, and typically we see that the market kind of tops out in the first, you know, second of September and kind of the first week of September. And then let's face it, we did not have any major economic developments this week, but we're going to for the rest of the month. We get the inflation print next week. We'll see how that shapes up. We're now in the Fed blackout period window. They can't talk about it anymore until September 21st. So I think the market is going to try to extrapolate any sort of data points that we get. And then the other thing that I would say, John, a lot of what supported the rally over the summertime, those forces are going to work in reverse if we hit any sort of potholes. And what I mean by that, you had a lot of the CTA community, the commodity trading advisors that have been adding length. And, you know, now that we're kind of trading below the key moving averages, they may not be chasing the market higher here. They might be net sellers. You also have the, the blackout window for buybacks as well. And corporate buyers have been the largest force in the market over a period of summer. And that's not going to be the case in September. So uh, I think it's nice that the futures are looking green today, but I probably wouldn't quite trust it for the month of September. Anastasia, I definitely sympathize with the bearish outlook. And some people might say that that's an understatement just generally in life. However, in this case, people have been making this case for a long time, right? Things are going to get worse. We haven't seen the full scope of pain. People are not fully pricing in recession. And yet we're seeing another weekly gain after a string of losses, but still the resilience sort of surprising. So what's working against the bears? What is working against that to get people somewhat enthusiastic, even if momentarily? Yeah, I think, Lisa, the big change over the last couple of months has been is we're now in this kind of soft landing scenario. I think that as actually is a scenario for a big part of the market. It's interesting, though. I was at a big client presentation earlier this week, and I asked the question, who here thinks we're in a recession? And about 50 percent of the people have actually raised their hands. So maybe 50 percent of the people think that, but the other 50 percent <laughs> still think that we're in the soft uh, soft landing scenario, that means that the market is likely to be kind of trapped in this range. Uh, right. And I think that's what we've really established, Tom, is this range between 3,700 to 4,300 on the S&P. Anastasia, what is a Bitcoin presentation? When you go to a Bitcoin presentation, what does it look like? It, it was a client presentation, Tom. It was a client market update, but we certainly did discuss some crypto. We discussed some uh, uh, outlook for alternative energy and many more topics. So that's our crypto discussion for the trying, next six months. Are you trying to cause trouble? That's our. Please, that please, Lisa, oh, pick up. I just wanted to get our crypto discussion. I just wanted to get our crypto discussion for the next six Thank months you. out of the way. Thank you, well, Anastasia. <laughs> but but going on the backs of that, just to try to create a segue that's not totally abrupt and awkward. The uh, this question of some of the more peripheral asset classes that have gotten defrothed, if you will, I'll make up words because we're tired here on surveillance. But I am wondering, from your perspective. Uh, whether that's something that we haven't seen the bottom of or whether it's fair to look at some of the things that have gotten most beaten up, you know, the, the, the pandemic darlings that have gotten absolutely eviscerated, whether we've seen the bottoming out in the frothier sectors or whether there's more to go. I think it's definitely, broadly speaking, that space is worth looking at, kind of the unprofitable, high growth, um, you know, tech area. But I would be very selective there. So, for example, you mentioned some of the pandemic darlings. I'm not sure that would be the top trade for me to look at right now because, yes, the valuations have reset, but the catalyst that was the pandemic is hopefully very much in the rearview mirror. And if you look at some of those companies that had this outsized, you know, couple of years of revenue and earnings growth, I don't think that's going to be repeatable in the next several years. So I'm right. not really tempted to pick up the pieces there. But if you look at parts of technology, whether it's your favorite semiconductor stocks or <laughs> software stocks or clean energy stocks, yeah. I very much think the catalyst for those are still in the years ahead. And we are looking at earnings growth that should outpace the S&P 500. So those would be the types of companies that I would look at. Anastasia Ramoroso, thank you from my capital on the latest. Stunning pictures coming in from outside Stunning. Buckingham Palace. King Charles III on the way to Buckingham Palace has stopped the car. He's got out, surrounded by security, and one by one, Tom, walking along people who have come to mourn his mother, the late Queen Elizabeth II, shaking hands with them, accepting For those flowers, on radio, Tom. Absolutely just stunning extraordinary. In the John, help me here. We've never seen this. Tom, you have to remember this is someone that lost their mother yesterday. It's an aspect of it that doesn't get discussed much. King Charles III taking over. 
who will shake hands and we'll have an address from the King later on today in about four hours time lease. So that's 6 p.m. local time. This is a human story and it is also a leadership story. But to your point, he is mourning the loss of his mother and he's going to give a speech shortly that will demonstrate that loss. But also he needs to step up into a new role that is not the Prince Charles role. It is a very different one as we've been talking about all morning. And it looks like he is trying to follow in his mother's at least uh, groundwork of trying to be with the people and not necessarily be just in the car. I talked about those comments that resonate with so many people that the the late Queen ensured national identity and dignity distinct from politics and at times Prince Charles has weighed into several topics. Tom hasn't been shy about doing that on things like architecture, things like the environment and there's been a suggestion throughout the whole of this morning in our conversations and Lisa just echoed them that King Charles will have to take on a very very different role Tom. Yeah and think about what he can and cannot say in, in this very new position for him. His security, I think, was trying to nudge him away, and he <laughs> had his Donald Trump moment. He pushed him away and went right back to it, shaking hands. It really hands. is a special moment. <clears throat> yeah. A special moment. We'll hear from the King himself, King Charles III, as I say, at 6 p.m. local time. For our audience on TV, we'll leave you with those pictures. I want to cross over to Bloomberg's Ros Matheson, who joins us from here in London. And Ros, only natural we start to think a little bit more about what we can expect in four hours from the King when he addresses this nation and the Commonwealth. What are your thoughts? Well, as you were saying, this is a man who's obviously now become king and needs to go into that role, but also he's someone who's just lost his mother. And you can see from those pictures, he's engaging with that crowd, but he's also clearly a man who's going through grief at the <coughs> loss of his mother. So you can expect him to talk very personally about her mummy, as he, as he has sometimes caused her, called her, and the genuine affection they had uh, with each other, particularly in the last uh, years of her life. You saw that come out much more publicly than before so he could be pretty candid about about that and their relationship he'll also have to sort of talk to the nation really now as their king as people who are going through this grief with him this change in the UK with him and he has to sort of set out some sort of vision in a way really in that moment can he also be that source of comfort for the UK that his mother was over seven decades through times mm -hmm. of turmoil can he really reassure the nation right. that he's with them and he's going to work with them Roz, you collate all of our worldwide reporting uh, that we have. Please identify the size of this funeral. Will it be a comparison to what we saw for John F. Kennedy in 1963? I, I can't imagine anybody will not show up. Everyone must attend, right? Well, that's right. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a monarch who ruled for seven decades, the longest ruling monarch in British history. This was a woman who spent all her life traveling around the world, building those relationships, not just with Commonwealth nations, but of course, with America, with, with many other countries around the world. You saw the affection with which the French president spoke of her last night, even as when he's had his own tensions with the UK government over Brexit. So you can imagine every leader will want to come here if possible, you'll also see the British people want to be involved in that just by the crowds that we're seeing outside Buckingham Palace today. It really will be a momentous moment for the UK to send her off with that funeral, both at an official level, but also at a very personal level for many people here in the UK. Ross, brilliant to catch up with you. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. Ross Matheson there as we look at pictures with King Charles III. Shaking hands, Tom, walking down towards Buckingham Palace, where we expect to see an address from him in about four and hours' a time. Kiss. <laughs> and a kiss as well. Uh, we've never seen this, and what's so interesting about this is to compare it with the fiction that we have seen in the different movies of t recent years. It is so radically different from that. I'm being told we will take, of course, that address by King Charles III in full, live on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio at 6 p.m. local time, that is 1 p.m. Eastern time. One thing that is always in our thoughts, though, separate from this, is this coming Sunday, marking the 21st anniversary of 9-11 in the United States. The New York Stock Exchange, which typically observes a moment of silence, will do so right now. We can head over there to observe that moment of silence for just a moment. Let's listen in.
paying tribute to the victims and the heroes of September 11th with a moment of silence on the New York Stock Exchange. Tom's still deeply emotional every single year and to think we're now in year 21, 21 years, the 21st anniversary I this would, Sunday. I would editorialize it gets worse every year. I mean, I, 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 I am surprised that it gets more difficult every year. It's true. We'll continue to bring you the latest events out of the UK through the day and over the next 10 days as well as we count you down towards the opening bell. Difficult to make that turn, Tom, but inevitable <laughs> on a program like this one. Toughest, that, uh, segue that, we've that, ever that we've, done. that we've got to in about eight minutes' time. We'll get that opening bell. I want to get you some movers just briefly with Equity Futures rallying. Let's get over to Abby over in New York. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, with Equity Futures rallying, that S&P 500 on pace for a third day higher, the first time that we'll see that in about three weeks. Not surprisingly, we have nice gains for stocks led by big tech. Apple, Microsoft are higher, but NVIDIA, the chip maker, really leading the way up almost 2%. This of course, as yields are lower, that helps valuation look better. But we also have a report uh, that the supply time, it has improved by about a day. J.P. Morgan Chase up about six tenths of one percent, so falling yields not weighing on banks. Oil is higher. Brent crude back above $90 per barrel, as you know, WTI above 85. So we do have big oil higher up 2.1 percent. But commodities overall, we have a nice rally. That Bloomberg Commodity Index up one percent. So you can see Alcoa up 3.2 percent on strength for the medals, John. It, John, it's a brilliant data check in that there were so many Dow and former Abby's Dow components in there. one of the best. I'm not sure she mentioned the Dow, though, did she? No, she didn't, but it was good no. to see the makeup it was of implied. the stock movers. There were, it, it was implied. <laughs> Clearly. She there knows, were no she, meme stocks She knows there. the rules of the show, doesn't she? <laughs> Some people did She killed that. Hey, Jim's Mike Collins joins us now. Mike, we're not going to talk about the Dow with you. We are going to talk about the Federal Reserve. Chairman Powell spoke yesterday, Mike. He talked about this need to re-anchor inflation expectations, that the clock was ticking. Was that a man doubling down on the comments from a few Fridays ago? Yeah, it certainly seems, Jonathan, that the central bankers around the world are starting to get a little nervous uh, that these inflation expectations are becoming embedded uh, in wages, in, in prices, even as we're seeing a lot of the inflation data, forward-looking data, really start to roll over. In fact, we're going to get a CPI number next week that could be negative, right, month over month. So, uh, but, but these central banks are, are clearly uh, doubling down uh, and they're trying to convince the markets that they're going to get rates high and leave them there uh, for longer than the markets believe right now. So the harder part of the curve might not be the front end, but rather the long end. And a lot of people had conviction a couple of months ago that the long end was where to stay because inevitably central banks would get inflation under control and yields would head lower. Do you agree with that premise or are you moving away from that because of some of the credit risk being introduced by fiscal plans because of the inflationary outlook? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I still think the long end of the curve is going to remain pretty well anchored. But I think the bang for your buck, not not to get too, too uh, inside baseball here, but it's really in the intermediate part of the curve. That's where we're trying to focus right now, right? Right now, the markets are pricing in a funds rate by next spring of about 4%. Uh, and then slowly going down, uh, maybe another 40 basis points throughout next year, and then another, you know, 60, 70 basis points in 2024. Uh, I think that's really consistent with the Fed's expected path. Uh, but the chances are that this economic outlook continues to deteriorate, and they have to, central banks globally have to reverse course more, more quickly. So, so you could get actually a lot of bang for your buck kind of in that five to 10 year part of the Treasury curve. Mike Collins of PJ. Mike, always great to catch up with you, sir. Thank you. Pictures just coming in of King Charles III entering Buckingham Palace on foot. We will hear from him in about four hours' time, Tom. I think make it about three and a half hours' time now. An address from King Charles III to the nation and the Commonwealth a little bit later. Choreographed, but sometimes it's not. That didn't feel choreographed, did, did that it? Feel no, choreographed. not at all. Uh, he, at one point, folks, he pushed one of the <laughs> security guys away. The way the car stopped, got out of the car to shake hands, Lisa, and make his way on foot into Buckingham Palace. It's important because what he's trying to do is follow in the footsteps of his mother, who is very Those aware are big footsteps. of the people around her. Live from London, this is Bloomberg.
the opening bell in New York City, just seconds away, live from London. Good afternoon. Futures positive, six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, higher by eight tenths of one percent. Movement in the bond market. Let's take a look at things. Twos and tens, your bond market's shaping up as follows. Yields down by two or three basis points. They were much lower. At least a moment ago, they sent Lewis Fed President Jim Bullard. He speaks again. Yeah, he was speaking to Bloomberg News saying... He's now favoring a third straight 75 basis point rate hike, and he expects uh, the Fed to hold rates higher for longer next year. Wall Street is underestimating this. And he said, I wouldn't let one data point sort of dictate what we are going to do at this meeting. So I am leaning more strongly towards 75 at this point. You are seeing a tick higher on the front is end. Is tick new? Well, I'll tell you what, this, this headline is a pushback against where we are right now. Some Correct. of this might yes. sound repetitive, yes. but the timing is important. But is this new Bullard? Markets underpricing higher for longer rates. This for you and I and for us as well, Tom, this was the standout part of the conversation for us in Jackson yes, Hole, Lisa. Yes. It was the pushback from a whole host of Fed officials who thought that market pricing, not for <clears> September <throat> and the meetings after that, who thought that market pricing through 2023 was too dovish, looking for rate right. cuts, and the push that he's trying to establish, and he's clearly not alone. Right. I think that's important here. He says that markets are underpricing higher for longer rates, that they're going to hike maybe towards four by the end of the year, and then they're going to sit there and maybe sit there for up to 12 months. And it's telling that he's doing this after the market already moved on those prior responses. And it comes as we speak with different strategists who say that they're not buying the Fed when the Fed is saying they are not going to pivot. And perhaps this is the Fed saying, listen to us. We're not just making things up. That's interesting to see. And again, what's so important to me is what's changed today is the Fed and then on one day later to the Bank of England. I think it's just great to see it on the 9, nine o'clock hour here that Caterpillar leads the Dow up this morning. Oh, is that point, right? 2.70%. Didn't I tell you it's against City of London rules to, to hey, well, you know. the Dow? You'd have the it's authorities from the square mile coming into the office. Everything's Sir changing. Pharaoh, Prince, it's going to send authorities after King, you. King Charles III is changing with a wonderful walkabout we just seen. And we quote the wasn't Dow. That, wasn't that great? Something. Wasn't that great? Oh, it's history making. I, I'm sorry. I mean, we, this isn't like Netflix, folks. This is real. And for the next 10 days, we are thrilled to come to you from John's United Kingdom to let you see these moments that are not choreographed. That was the first moment, Tom, for me, and I suggest it might be for others as well, where you felt like the nation was gaining something. And the last 24 yes. hours has been about losing something. And the next 10 days will be that way as well. Yeah. But the way the king engaged the crowd gave you a sense that we were, we were gaining something, and, and you'll hear it again repeatedly. Long live the king, and we'll hear from the king himself well, at 6 p.m. local time, Tom. We will. And with the uh, what is it, SPX up 30, Dow up 196. Do <laughs> Thanks for data? that. You carry on. Okay, is, is, is Abby still with I'm, us, I'm or is Abby walked I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut your mic in a moment. We're up three <laughs> quarters of 1% the first time. <laughs> on the S&P. Let's get you some movers. We can do that with Abby back in New York. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do, of course, have a nice uh, start here for stocks, as you all were just talking about. The major indexes are higher. That S&P 500 up for a third day in a row. The first time we've seen that in three weeks. A big help, Apple, up about six tenths of 1%. That of of course, is the heavyweight. You were talking about the move in bonds. We have a rally there. That means yields down. That helps valuation on the big tech and growth stocks look better. So we again have a rally for Apple and some of the other techs such as Microsoft and NVIDIA. But even with yields lower, banks are higher too. So it's a broad-based rally. Take a look at Bank of America, one of the big money center banks, up 1.3 percent. Oil, a rally there as well. WTI crude back above $85 per barrel. That has Chevron up 1.4 percent. And then finally rounding it out, it is again a broad-based rally, commodities higher too, that Bloomberg Commodity Index up more than 1%. A piece of it has to do uh, with China, of course, that CPI data coming out better. They are the world's largest user of natural resources. Copper higher, that means Freeport, MacMoran, and other miners up 3%. Tom, John, and Lisa? Happy. Thank you. We're going to build on this, I'm pleased to say. Good friend of this program over the years, Jonathan Golub of Credit Suisse. John, you've become a little bit of a rarity. Someone who's constructive on this equity market, a bit more bullish. So let's talk about it. What is the bullish sell, the big argument going into year end? Well, I mean, I, I, recently there's a lot of very, very positive news that's not getting enough press. But the most important one is that inflation expectations are absolutely collapsing on where inflation is going to be a year or 18 months from now. And um, if you look at the one year break even, um, it's actually predicting that in a year from now, we will be below 
two percent on on headline CPI. Now a lot of that is on energy prices, but nonetheless, um, that would be a, mm. a really big deal. And that's ultimately the reason why the market is saying that the Fed is going to blink, because if when we get to the first quarter and inflation is you know something in the ballpark of four percent. And the prediction is that there's momentum behind this and it's going to keep falling. Why would the Fed unnecessarily drive us into recession, kill you know several million American jobs if, in fact, inflation is heading in the right direction? There's a bunch of other positives, but that's the most important story. Right. John, you've got the advantage of Credit Suisse securities research. What do they say about this present quarter in Q4 as well? Gosh, Tom, you know, this is one of those situations where I find myself in, in, on the other side of the conversation with a lot of our analysts. The, the estimates are coming down across most of, of the coverage universe, um, you know, across sectors. And the reason is, is that companies delivered in, you know, really, really strong second quarter results, but then gave you know, very, very poor guidance on what the future was going to look like, both for the third quarter and then for all of next year. So the analysts listening to company management, not, you know, not looking at the macro data, and they have no choice but to, you know, lower their estimates in line with that, you know, that, you know, th their inputs. And then I'm looking at this environment and saying, you know, it, it doesn't look robust, but, you know, following such a strong second quarter, I just don't get why estimates are falling this much. I look, John, at, at the estimate dynamics, all that's out there. We're going into a weekend. And as you know, John, all the Gloom crew publishes Friday afternoon. That just seems to be the racket. What do they get most wrong? The, um, I think that the big issue is, is one of timing. Uh, there's always a recession in our, in our future. And the, 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 there's two big signals that are, are quite negative. The first one is that the weekly jobless claims, this is, you know, people becoming unemployed for the first time, um, those readings are, are going up, and that's a, a, a legitimate concern. However, with so many open job positions, these people are getting redeployed into other jobs, and the unemployment rate is not going up. So that is something that I think that they're they're only looking at um, half of the story. The other thing is is that you know the yield curve is inverted, but more importantly, the the, the three month to ten year part of the yield curve is going to invert when the Fed makes their next move, and that's a really you know that's obviously a big issue. But if you look historically, it takes eleven months from that point of time on average to get to a recession. So yes, we may have a recession, but it may be you know, a year from now, 18 months from now, and being early on calling a recession is being wrong. I love how stock analysts are increasingly becoming bond strategists and vice versa, and that seems to be the theme that continues throughout the year. John, I want to really uh, tie this together with the question about the pivot and this idea of lower rates and this uh, conviction that the Fed cannot do the damage that a lot of people fear. Today we heard from Jim Bullard, coming out yet again saying we don't know what the market is looking at. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that's not what we're seeing. And we plan on doing something that does not look anything like a pivot. How do you get conviction to simply discount that? Well, so, Lisa, think about this in terms of, of, of game theory. Um, you know, the Fed needs to get inflation down in order to stop. If they tell you that they're going to stop right now, you know, three, four, six months from now, then... The inflation expectations are going to rise because the Fed is done. So if they even want the opportunity to pivot, they have to talk really hawkishly. And, and so you have this very strange dynamic where in the, in the CPI next, you know, next Tuesday is expected to come in at roughly 8 um, percent, a little bit lower than where it was. But a year from now, it's expected to be back in the normal range. The Fed needs to manage what's going to happen 12 or 18 months from now. But if they talk too dovishly too early, they're going to they're not going to achieve their goal. So I think that's what, you know, if there's a bullish argument, it's that in many ways, of course, the Fed's going to talk hawkishly. They have no choice. So ignore it. And, 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 and so what is the Fed going to do? They're going to just keep pounding and pounding on this hawkish theme and, and, and try to ultimately uh, win that conversation.
John, I got your note a couple of days ago, and it was a title that I haven't actually read much of before. Earnings estimates collapsing. Hey, John, when was the last time we talked about that? Because that's what the equity bears have been suggesting we still haven't had. And that's going to lead to the next leg lower in the equity market. Can you just build on the detail beneath that headline, earnings estimates collapsing, John? Yeah, so, um, so far uh, this quarter, since um, the end of June, um, and this is what we're talking about, how what, what our analysts are saying is, is a bit different than what I'm, I'm seeing right now. Um, the estimates across Wall Street are down about 5.5% for the third quarter and, and over 3% for next year. Now, putting this in perspective, this, this is a really big, um, you know, downdraft on earnings. Now, they're not expected to go negative. Um, but they, but this is a, a you know move really substantially in the wrong direction. What's most concerning, John, is is where it's coming from, and and big tech is by far the worst of this um, of this whole picture. And and it's not like it's one group. Internet retail is having a hard time. The big communications companies like the Facebooks and the Googles on weaker advertising and software and semis and hardware. So it's it's extremely broad based. And um, what my guess is, is that if the economic data continues to be where it is right now, I and mean, if you look at like the uh, City Economic Surprise Index, it's jumping. The data is coming in better that I think you're going to get pretty good beats. But the but corporate management and the analyst community, um, like I was mentioning before, is much more skeptical. So, John, where do you think that skepticism is justified when it comes to earnings, though? Would you acknowledge that some of that around the earnings expectations is justified? Is there a part of the equity market you'd still well clear of? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I think that there's actually a really big problem in, in the technology space. Um, in many ways, what we're experiencing now feels a lot like Y2K. When we all you know, started working from home, we got new <clears throat> iPads and laptops and we signed up for Netflix and our employers had to get new software and infrastructure to allow us to work from home. And there was a massive increase in tech spending, but that pulled activity from the future. And now we're seeing really pretty poor results. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the FANG definition, but FANG stocks had a negative earnings growth of negative 24% in the second quarter, where the overall market was plus 10. Um, this, I think, is the biggest difference between tech to the downside versus the market since the iPhone came out, you know, well over a decade ago. So uh, that area is actually expected to be weaker. Where I think that you may see more upside is the consumer, I think, is in better health. Um, and, uh, you know, even in, in other areas like, uh, like industrials and, and materials, I think that things are okay. Um, mm. I think you're going to see solid results from defensive shares, but they're really, really expensive. So, you know, but they'll, but they'll hold up okay. John, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Jonathan Golub there of Credit Suisse with a much more constructive view on yes. this equity market. Some concerns, though, legitimate concerns, Tom, around the tech sector and the equity market and the earnings expectations in the year to come. Absolutely. Uh, a, a moment there maybe of optimism on American capitalism. This is a queen who has seen many prime ministers, and, of course, it began with Churchill. Before that, Winston Churchill spoke in Fulton, Missouri, of our special relationship. Joining us now, the former Secretary of State of the United States, he is U.S. Special Presidential Con Envoy for Energy, John Kerry. Uh, I must call you Mr. Secretary. John, you and I did climate change in Davos a number of years ago, but today we turn to the British royalty and the future of the United Kingdom. There must be a new special relationship with Prime Minister Truss and with King Charles III. How do you see that special relationship forming? Well, that's obviously internal to Britain. And, um, you know, I have total confidence uh, King Charles is very savvy. He's been uh, thinking about this and preparing for it for a long time and standing in for his mother in these recent months. So. Uh, he already has relationships with uh, m most of those folks, and I think I think we'll be um, very, very skilled at sort of marching that line between the requirements of the constitutional monarchy 
but also urging, as uh, former monarchs have, uh, a certain sense of direction for the country they love and serve. John Kerry, you have a special relationship with the former queen, the deceased queen, and that a few years ago you were at a meeting with her and she said, oh, I saw you on the telly. And it was the acclaim, of course, of what you're doing in, in climate. <laughs> yeah. Describe what Queen Elizabeth II meant to you and the Kerry family. Well, I uh, first of all, it was it was not a few years ago. It was just uh, recently in this past year uh, at an event that uh, King Charles had organized with businesses from all around the world to come in and be supportive of the climate uh, efforts. And he's been deeply involved in those climate efforts. In fact, that's why I'm here. We were meeting, going to meet yesterday in Scotland, and I just was there. Uh, but obviously, uh, that meeting was canceled. But he was summoning business people from around the world together with uh, non-governmental organizations to try to work and exhort action on climate, uh, which has been a passion of his for many, many years. But uh, I mean, my family <laughs> has, has always uh, been uh, affected by the Queen because my mother spent some period of time when her father was over here doing business and she lived in England. and. They all grew up uh, very much as Anglophiles, fans of, of the Queen particularly. And, and so, um, you know, I, but I think everybody feels that way. That, that, you know, she's lived with much of the population of the planet uh, for a long period of time because of her longevity and the length of her reign, 70 years. Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of people for whom that's the only leader, the only sovereign monarch of uh, Great Britain that they know. Secretary Kerry, you talked about uh, the role of current King Charles III in pushing forward the green agenda and uh, the concern about climate change and the need to address it. Do you expect, based on your conversations with him, with the monarch uh, party that we're looking at right now, that he will continue in that role as king, not just as prince? Well, that's up to him to, to decide and to work out uh, appropriately. Uh, I hope he does, because I think he's had impact uh, and, and his voice is, is critical going forward. Um, it's not political. There's, there's no ideology in it. It's not a Republican, Democrat, slash, Tory, Labor issue. Uh, it's a universal issue defined by science. And he's been way ahead of the curve for 50 years. But uh, he has been engaged uh, with, with consequence. So I hope he will be, and, but it's up to them, uh, you know, the, he and, and uh, the palace to decide what direction well, it will go. Secretary Kerry, right now it is deeply political with respect to the energy crisis and how it's addressed and with respect to how to heat homes and things that are being used now include coal and there's a real effort to bring down prices. So how does this fit in to the efforts to just simply keep households warm, to keep things running, keep uh, economies uh, in shape going forward? How does that work right now? Well, it works the way the Europeans and others are making it work. The government of, of Great Britain has been very clear. They're working on energy. But energy, uh, that part of energy policy is not uh, directly, uh, it's, it's, it's not happening because of climate. It's happening because of the war in Ukraine. And it's happening because of shortages and other things that contributed in policy terms. Uh, that is not. Uh, the purview of, of the monarch, that is the purview of those who are in politics. But what he's been doing is urging people to take the climate crisis seriously and to show the ways in which one can enhance an economy, uh, one can make people's lives healthier and safer and cleaner by moving towards an alternative, broad-based new energy economy, a new future. That's something he's been talking about for 50 years. So I, I, I think that's different from the politics of a specific energy policy about whether you bail people out or whether you're providing a, you know, a support for the price of fuel as, they are, as has been proposed here in Great Britain. That's up to the politicians to decide. But I think that uh, His Majesty understands uh, the line between 
involving in that kind of thing versus uh, exhortations to greater action. Remember that uh, the, the, his predecessors, both his mother uh, and, uh, you know, the kings prior to that, were very outspoken about how to get through the war, uh, how to summon the, uh, the needed resolve to be able to stand up to the deprivations of the war. And, and yeah. even Winston Churchill relied on the king and his engagement in that. So I think that on the climate crisis, uh, he understands better than anybody how to do that. I hope his voice will continue to be heard. He spoke at the World Economic Forum last year, made, I thought, a very important speech and contribution. And his leadership on, this, on the Sustainable Markets Initiative, which has brought the private sector to the table, has been vital because we can't solve the problem without the private sector being deeply engaged. And he's been way ahead on that curve, too. John, before you go, can you just take a moment to describe the scenes behind you and what it was like to see Charles walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king? In all honesty, I, I can't describe that because I'm facing the other way and talking to you, and I haven't seen any of that play out. Oh, so I, I oh, can well, John imagine. Kerry, I thought, that I thought I you might have seen it a few minutes ago, John. Okay. No, that's fine, John. But please review that no, as I you can. It was to. really magical. It was really magical uh, to see. Well, thank you for being with us, and thank Guy Johnson for grabbing you it. and I, putting you in front of the camera. I try to see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. John Kerry, there, the U.S. I'm sure it special presidential envoy for climate. John Kerry there. He missed the moment. He's there at Buckingham Palace, Tom, and he, he missed the, point, the moment. But, but, but again, it's how schedules have been blown up, including ours. We're here for 10 days. All of a sudden, we knew this moment would come. But here we are, and Secretary Kerry's at climate change in Scotland. Things change. That's where we are for the next 10 days. And David Merritt joins us now. He saw it. Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Europe. David, before we reflect on that, we've got to push forward to what's going to take place in this country when we hear, hear from King Charles III at 6 p.m. local time. David, any thoughts on what we can expect from that address to this nation and the Commonwealth? Yes, well, it's going to be a hugely significant moment for the new, for the new King Charles. Um, he's clearly been preparing for this, uh, as John Corry Kerry said, for, for a very long time. But that initial pledge to the nation, you know, we all heard many times... Uh, Queen Elizabeth's vow, which she, which she made at her accession to serve the country for the entirety of her life. And that was the vow that she made that she clearly uh, kept working until the very end uh, this week. So what will King Charles say? The whole nation will be listening and the, the broader Commonwealth mm -hmm. and world as well. What sort of king is he going to be? You know, he's, he's in his 70s, he's the oldest monarch, British monarch, to ascend the throne. So we've been living with him as Prince of Wales for an awfully long time. But, of course, it is going to be different with him now, having succeeded his mother. Some of the issues that he cares about, we've just been talking about, his leadership on climate change, we can expect that to continue. But in what, in what fashion, um, how mm. will that differ from before when right. he's actually the monarch? David, the enormity of the moment of a new prime minister, which I would suggest is under duress and the X number of prime ministers in the Y number of years, which you know, and I don't know that statistic, but it, can, it inflates here with the death of Queen Elizabeth. Link the two together, the moment of a new prime minister, a new king, that's extraordinary. It is extraordinary, um, and the two leading figures in this country are, of course, the Prime Minister and the monarch. Um, we were just getting used to the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, on Tuesday. She travelled to Balmoral to shake the Queen's hand, the, the Queen's last act as monarch, or official act, really. Um, and the country, in, there is a sense of crisis in the country. And there were, we were talking about the energy crisis. The government were preparing, the new government of Liz Truss were preparing a huge package of support for households and businesses, up to £200 billion worth of subsidies, um, really eye-watering numbers. We were expecting an emergency budget to come in the next couple of weeks. Right now, all government business is suspended. So a, a very different sort of administration in Downing Street was being put together by Liz Truss, and now a different monarch in Buckingham Palace. It's, a, it's an entirely new Britain uh, with those two new leaders at the front. David Merritt. David, thank you. Thank you very much.
It's on what a day. And we've got nine more days of mourning in this country. And I think we're all waiting now for that address from this king in a few hours' time. And we move on from the address to the events of tonight and, frankly, the events of tomorrow. I think we should hear from the prime minister tomorrow as well. Looking forward to hearing from the prime minister. Uh, and Lisa, looking forward to hearing from the king. Yeah, it's regime change on many levels. And this idea of a new path forward in a new environment, in a new world order, which we've been talking about with deglobalization or re you know, sort of uh, regionally globalized kinds of worlds, we are now looking at a new crown after one had been in place for 70 years, a generation. A nation in mourning. And the stat I mentioned at the start of the program, I'll, <clears throat> I'll end with it. Lisa, 70 years on the throne, longer than 85% of this country has been alive. It's amazing. It's amazing to, think to try and get your head around that. When she came to uh, power, the images were not able to be transmitted. They used film and they had to ship it over the Atlantic to the United States. Guy Johnson's going to pick things up from here and guide you towards that address from King Charles III. Live from London, this is Bloomberg Surveillance.